and she would have been directed to the political leadership of the department. Mm -hmm. um, is there, then I want to check if, uh, uh, but I'm just registering a concern, but I want to also check if the department is there, um, uh, the DG, DDG uh, responsible for uh, skills branch, are they here? Uh, so that maybe when we raise <clears throat> those questions of ours, uh, they are able to uh, at least uh, answer some of them, because some of them would have would have to oh, go ours. to them. Uh, they are able to take leadership. Thank you very much. I thought I must just uh, register that concern. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and before maybe Chair, you come in, I see uh, Sita might need my IT skills. Can I just help them to resolve the <clears throat> uh, their presentation layout here on the on the screen? Thanks, Chair. Uh, you may thanks for registering your concern, and you may um, guide them before I respond. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure uh, who's. Um, going to be doing um, the presentation or running the slide, can they just go to display setting there on the top bar? Um, yeah. And then, uh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Chairperson. You can, you can now answer me. Thank you very much, Honorable Itie, for assisting with your IT skills. But I also want to say that your concern is well in order and perhaps check, I mean, ideally what we would want is the political leadership to be present. Um, I think there is an agreement that when the minister is not available, then at least the DM ought to be available. So let us check um, if anyone is present from uh, the skills program. I don't see anyone on the platform, but Anele, maybe you, you can assist or colleagues can assist. Oh, good morning, Chair and Honorable Members. It's Sonti from the DG's office. We are here, Chair. Mr. Mabuza Ngubani, who is representing the DDG skills, is also in attendance. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, colleagues. I, I do hope we will be able to um, uh, respond to some of the questions that will come, but I do share uh, similar sentiments to Honorable Itie in terms of um, the nature of questions that might arise that ought to be uh, accounted for by the department and taking into consideration our limitation of time, um, you know, we may not be, if, if we are unable to get sufficient responses um, from, from the colleagues that are, are represented here today, it, it does put us uh, on the back foot in terms of being able to, in, in, in terms of the program and having to then go back uh, or set aside time once again to deal with these matters. Um, but Honorable Itzia, your, your concern is really noted and, um, uh, and, and, and supported. Uh, let us then continue with the inputs from the chair who will lead um, the, the CETA handing over to them, the CEO. Good morning, chair. Good morning, honorable members. Uh, good morning to my colleagues. And thank you very much for the opportunity to invite us to have an interface with the portfolio committee. My name is Tabo Masomboga. I thought for the initial stage of this engagement, I need to at least show up my face so that there's comfort that this is not a ghost person. This is not a ghost individual. I will then- I appreciate uh, chairperson. <laughs> we'll see you another ghost. <laughs> All right, so for, for purposes of um, convenient fluence of the presentation, I will ask for permission to then 
disengage my face, but will do so upon request. <clears throat> Chairperson, we, 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 we thought we should honor your invitation for primarily for two things, for two reasons. One, seeing that this is the inaugural interface of the newly appointed accounting authority, appointed by the Minister of um, Higher Education and Training in terms of the Skills Development Act. Um, we thought it's important that we come and announce our presence and inform you that uh, we have now be, been appointed, albeit, um, albeit the board or the accounting authority is not yet fully complete, uh, complete, uh, completed. I will talk to that quite uh, a little bit later. And secondly, <clears throat> we thought that it's important that we interact with the portfolio committee to then give you comfort on the various issues that you have requested in your letter of invitation. I'll request my colleague to, to move on to the next, next slide. But for purposes of introduction, I am joined by the um, CEO. You will then confirm, according to the decision of the board, we are supposed to have uh, two other board members, which is uh, Mr. Denny Masimene, um, who represent organized business, organized employer, in the in the accounting authority, we also have Mr. Philip Villagazi, who represents organized uh, labor in the accounting authority. Those are the two board members with which I was requested to come and interact with yourselves. Then the CEO has brought the full complement of his senior executive managers, who will then uh, he will then introduce them as he then take over. The next uh, uh, two slides, I mean, uh, immediately after I've dealt with the, uh, uh, the, these two slides, we understand this invitation to be centered around the issues that we currently present or uh, project, which uh, the overview of the CETA governance and management, budget allocated to the skills development interventions for the period 2022 and 2023. And obviously, we'll talk to you about the breakdown on the skills development interventions in accordance with various provinces, race, gender, and all empowerment uh, uh, designation. We will talk to you as per your invitation to the support programs for black emerging contractors and service providers in the construction training space, the, the, the bursaries and internships and more importantly, on number six, to give you an update on the, on the issues that were raised by the, the, the union, now on governance and management. And lastly, and talk to you about the programs that are geared in supporting the district development models. If you go to the next slide, we then, uh, <clears throat> But we should, as it is now a matter of public knowledge, that the, the, the CETA had no accounting authority or board, at least for the past two years. The minister did place it under administration from the period February 2020 until 2nd of February 2022 this year. Following a process of advertisement and recruitment, the uh, board members, at least 10 board members were appointed. There are still five vacancies currently not being filled. We have mandated the CEO to, to institute a re-advert, which closed on the 28th, uh, which was meant to close on the 21st of September. But given the challenges of, <clears throat> of, 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 ineligibility by those applicants were to extend the, 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 the advert for the closing date of the period of the, until the, 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 the 30th of this month. We will then continue with the process of shortlisting and reviewing the names and the applicants that are there. 
and then make a pro an appropriate uh, relevant recommendation to the minister to ensure that uh, that uh, that process is completed. The already existing members of the accounting authority have held their first induction session on the 5th and 6th of September. It is also important for this committee to know that <clears throat> for all intent and purposes, at least three of the current board members are returning board members. Um, uh, two from 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 uh, organized labor and at least one from uh, organized uh, employers. We think that it's important for a number of reasons. First, to ensure that there's at least intellectual continuity of processes and thought, but secondly, so that the accounting authority does not start completely from a, a vacuum or from a point of no reference at all. Members and honorable members, Chairperson would be interested to know that in considering the appointment of the Chairperson, which is an independently appointed individual, the minister took into account a number of factors, including, including but not limited to the fact that the incumbent Chairperson is the former chief executive of the construction sector charter council which is an executive authority entrusted with the overseeing of empowerment and transformation in the construction sector. Previously, a senior member in the, a senior management member in the Department of Trade and Industry, which drove and facilitated the appointment, I mean, the finalization of the BE legislative framework. The incumbent is also an admitted attorney who is a senior legal transformation um, and empowerment consultant. So the minister took into account, at least we want to believe, the fact that it is critical for this construction education and training authority to redeem itself, at least in the face of uh, current levy payers within the sector, who as a result of the collapse of governance and systems in that sector had to show some level of disinterest and others even left the set. We are seized and preoccupied with efforts to redeem the, at least the image, but more importantly, the efficiency of the organization to ensure that it goes back to its glory days, particularly at the level of financial management and quality training. On the second last point, in our inaugural um, uh, induction session and the, 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 the board meeting held on the 7th of September, we ensured that we reinstitute what we call governance uh, uh, layers of the organization by setting up the board executive committee, the finance remuneration, HR and ethics committee, which is what is previously known as a core business committee but also ensuring that this governance strategy and ICT committee, we'll talk to more about that when we discuss the operational reintegration of this board. The audit and risk committee, which is, uh, is, 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 is to be chaired by an independent chairperson, somebody who's not currently part of this accounting authority. Um, the committee members and chairperson will be interested to know that during the administration, was only one committee that was operational. This is the audit and risk committee whose term ended on the 15th of August, 2022. So we, 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 we are working towards ensuring that at least that committee is reinstated so that it has the full complement of the board operation. Jefferson, I thought as an opening remark, I need to give you on behalf of the board and on behalf of the accounting authority, that level of comfort that Yes, we, we, most of, 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 of board members are fairly new, but there is one or two or three, like I indicated, who are returning board members. The issues that we have been seized with since the appointment are quite frankly voluminous in the sense that all of, if not most, deal with investigations that relate to the cause for the collapse of governance and management systems. And we have 
agreed that once the board complement is fully set up, fully appointed, the vacancies are filled, we will then, as early as next month, before the end of October, get together as board members to constitute what is called a high-level strategy session. Which strategy session will focus on a number of priorities that relate to ensuring that this board get back, this organization get back to its core business. Deals with issues of stipends and training, deals with issues of management and financial prudence, deals with issues of actioning the investigation reports, deals with issues of reinstating confidence and relationship between management and the employer and the employees through their representative union, but ensuring that whatever has been raised as the concerns and complaints by the uh, uh, employees through their union now are urgently and expediently dealt with so that everyone in that organization gets back to it's all hands on decks focusing on what the public is using and the levy payers are using as the, as the money that is meant to focus on court training. And our preoccupation in line with the theme that has already been adopted by management, that of one seat, one team, is to ensure that most importantly, the business of the Construction and Education Training Authority is around training and not just training, but quality, quality, and quality, and quality training so that young people who are looking forward to these sector education and training authorities really find comfort in being ushered with the relevant skills that will incubate them back into uh, the economy, incubate them back into the, 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 the construction value chain. Chairperson, I will pause there for now, take over uh, this opportunity and, 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 and over the opportunity to the CEO, who will then introduce his senior management team and then take to you the, the, the following aspects that deals with the uh, management structure and a number of other operational issues. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, CEO, you can take over. Thank you, Jefferson. Good morning to the chair of the portfolio committee, uh, members of the portfolio committee, my chair and my board members, and the executive management. I hope I can see my video. Hope it's showing on the side also in the same token that I'm not a ghost. We can see you, CEO. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Then on that note, I'll ask that uh, uh, since my face has been seen, I'll switch off the video. Then with the introduction, I've got my executive managers and C acting CFO that are here in this meeting. I will ask Chairperson with your permission that maybe they show their face as well as a, a show of greetings to the portfolio committee. <clears throat> Uh, we have uh, a, in the presence in this meeting, Ms. Mlebocheng Tobela, Executive Manager Strategic Supported CETA. We got Mr. Pumzile Yego, who is Executive uh, Manager ETQA and Projects, and Mr. Zeno Lolifuzwe, uh, our C acting CFO uh, in the meeting. If I can ask the two colleagues, just show your, your faces for the sake of the members to not who Good morning, Chairperson and the members. Uh, good morning, Honorable Members and uh, Board Members and colleagues. Uh, I'm Senator Ali Fuji. Well, my name is Bumzile Yako. I'm executive for client services and projects. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And then, colleagues, uh, you can switch off your videos. Uh, Chair and members, will pardon my voice if it uh, get lost along the way. I'm still recovering from the flu. And uh, we were, as we were requested to do presentation on particular and specific uh, matters, uh, with regard to executive management at the at the CETA, 
currently we have uh, five executive positions, including that of the CEO, which uh, four of them are filled as shown in the slide. Currently, we are in the process of filling the board secretary and support role, uh, which is under recruitment as we speak. <laughs> when it comes to uh, support that management, this is the committees that we have in the organization supporting management. Next slide. The CETA management is supported by uh, various committees as prescribed by the organizations operational policies and procedures, which amongst others, we got the ICT steering committee that oversees the issues of IT, digitization, et cetera. We also got in terms of the loss control uh, policy as prescribed by uh, the regulations, a loss control committee that's responsible for overseeing issues of irregular expenditure, fruitless and wasteful expenditure, and their control and recovery in case they happen. We also supported by a training provider allocation committee, which is a, a transformational committee that allocates uh, uh, the training providers to the employers that would have been awarded the discretionary grant uh, uh, window awards uh, for the implementation of our skills programs and learning pathways. Because of particular uh, diagnosis that was done at the organization due to the issues that uh, were experienced, some of them spilling out to the media. We have established what we call a one seater, one team committee, which is responsible to, for the next 18 months to make sure that the proposed uh, interventions to bridge and address all the issues facing employees and the organization as, as a whole uh, are addressed appropriately. We also got what we call a CSI, Corporate Social Investment Committee. We also have a, a pension fund committee, which is responsible to look at the issues of how the pension for the employees is invested. And also that will, as soon as the report that was dealing with the investigation of this matter is uh, uh, publicized. They will be taking the recommendations of those and be the Ubu that will be spearheading such. We got OHS committee, which is occupational health and safety as prescribed. Those are the operational committees that we have internally in the organization. Then as required, when it comes to the budget for the current financial year, which, uh, as was requested, we, yeah, thank you. We are showing here what is sitting currently in our APP as was approved by the executive authority responsible for the CETA. In terms of different pathways, uh, our major one uh, that shows that we'll be spending a lot on is learnerships entered, which most of them are funded. We have excluded all the ones that are industry funded, meaning funded by the, in the, the, the sector. And we, we have uh, almost a target of 3,000 learnerships unemployed to be entered in this financial year, uh, budgeted at 165 million. And then for employed learners, uh, and uh, we've got 221. And then for skills programs entered, which uh, most of them include both the discretionary grant window applications plus the ERRP, as was announced by the President of the Republic. We had uh, various targets along those lines, uh, which is uh, currently sitting at 3.5, uh, at 52.5 million. And then for employed learners on Simon DG and the uh, ERRP, we got 500. And then for artisan and entered, which is apprenticeships, we got a target of 2,200, which is uh, the biggest uh, area because of the cost involved in producing an artisan uh, budget at 332 million for the current year. And then for bursaries, uh, we have uh, for unemployed bursary learners enrolled, which will be the new enrollment for this calendar uh, uh, year or academic year, sitting at 150 at uh, 20 million. Uh, uh, maybe just to highlight in this 150, we got the pure target of those who are what is called uh, meeting the normal criteria as set also in the NS first criteria. Uh, and then 50 of those were earmarks for the missing middle 
uh, beneficiaries out of that 150 for this year. And then for employed learners, we targeted the 113 because we got an obligation as well to support worker uh, initiated programs. And then on internships, uh, we got a target of 352 internships, which ranges between 12 to 18 months uh, at a budget of 21 million. Uh, for university students placements, uh, we, we have a target of 119. And then for TVET uh, student placement entered, which is a target also that the president during the SONA uh, allocated that 10,000 uh, TVET uh, learners need to be placed. So CETA uh, by virtue of that was allocated by the department that at least a minimum target of 600, which is what we are showing here, what we'll be running with to make sure that we afford the opportunity to TVET students for their placements who gain practical experience for them to be able to graduate. <clears throat> Then uh, on candidacy programs, which are our professional programs where we produce the likes of the engineers, the technicians, uh, we had a target of 237. Uh, because these are long uh, uh, term in the main, whereby you find somebody will be sitting for exams over a period of two to three years. Uh, we have the target for this current year, it's budgeted at 6.2. And then for RPL at the moment, um, it's 1,518. We know that uh, after this APP was approved, there was a new secular that uh, talks to new rates. Uh, the budget is now higher than what is currently shown uh, as far as this uh, target is concerned. So, Chairperson, these are the major APP uh, 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 skills interventions per hour APP. Then in terms of these interventions, uh, as we requested that we should be showing a breakdown uh, provincially, gender-wise, and racially, and also to show people with disabilities, it is our transformational policy that on all our DG allocations and awards, at least the learners that are awarded should be at least 51% uh, females. And then uh, on the... Training providers themselves, the same criteria apply that we targeting to award training provider companies that are owned at least 50% by women and uh, majority to be black. And then in terms of the breakdown, as it is shown, apprenticeship is one that is carrying uh, major numbers for us, total of 38 and then uh, we got 2.2 female, which is above 51%, and the males and also Africans in this case, African black being the majority, followed by colored and few Indians under apprenticeships. In terms of the provincial spread, currently we have uh, uh, the bulk number in Pumalanga province, followed by Gauteng. Um, then on RPL, um, we got the total of 880 that has been uh, allocated for this current financial year, uh, which in the main is Africans. And also <clears throat> this one is less in terms of female representation, uh, but close to 50%. Candidacy, we got a total of 469 that uh, we have awarded or are currently in the programs. In the main, most of them, because of the nature of our economy, most of them are based in Gauteng. And then for trade testing, got 176, which uh, the bulk of them in is Limpopo, followed by Gauteng and Free State. Uh, for learnerships, 902. Um, same pattern with Gauteng leading in that area. And then for TVET placement and higher, and higher education and training placement, which is traditional universities and universities of technology, we got 180 and 318 respectively. Then on the short skills that uh, currently includes also the ERRPs that uh, are yet to be finalized, we got 1.7, which in the main, uh, in terms of the racial spread, uh, it's a majority for one reason or the other it is the colors followed by Africans. Then in terms of the gender representation, we also got the same spread, majority being females. Then 
the, the percentages per province are shown at the bottom of this slide, where we're indicating that most provinces are showing the same pattern that all our programs uh, are attended uh, mainly by females, except I think there is only one province uh, that is that is the free state that shows more males than uh, uh, the females. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> We were also requested to talk on, on the support programs we have for black and emerging contractors. Uh, in this financial year, uh, the city is rolling out a project. We've got a target of uh, uh, assisting 200 learners on uh, entrepreneurship in all nine provinces. This project is budgeted to be funded at uh, 11 million and the expected completion date is uh, April, 2023, uh, covering all aspects, how to run a proper business, the issues of entrepreneurship and uh, uh, leading a successful business. Then we got also the imperatives that uh, we, we roll out uh, in the form of skills development centers, which become mini campuses or a bridge between the institutions of higher learning that's in the main uh, in the urban areas. And then we have most of our skills development centers either in the townships or in the rural areas where they become a mini campus of either a TVET college or a traditional university if there's no close by TVET college. And then the construction of those, there's a standard requirement that uh, uh, for their construction, there is subcontracting as also prescribed uh, in the PPFA regulations. Uh, we endeavor that uh, the the contracts, uh, the issues of local content and localization are prioritized when the awards for this construction of these of these schemes development centers are awarded. And then the main contractors are encouraged to make sure that uh, they subcontract only the local SMEs from the communities. And then over and above uh, that, uh, we are targeting individuals that need to be trained on, on how to start a business. And then we have issued expression of interest, which will be closing uh, in October in this regard to train 20 learners uh, to start businesses, which will be a full or comprehensive business support from the CETA. On top of that, uh, the CETA has concluded a memorandum of understanding with the Construction Industry Development Board, which is responsible for the uh, transformation of the sector uh, from a construction perspective uh, in ensuring, amongst other things that we're collaborating on, is the capacitation of emerging contractors in terms of their contractor development program, which is aimed at assisting those who in the bulk will be sitting maybe between level two and level four to be able to graduate or to develop their companies to, to have a better grading on the CIDB, which means then they can participate meaningfully in the construction work. And then this uh, MOU as well is aimed at assisting in that since CIDB is responsible for registering most of the construction projects, uh, the CETA at some point struggles to find workplaces for our learners to gain practical experience. So this collaboration with CIDB will assist us in understanding where are the projects going to be happening in the next 18 to 24 months so that when we plan, we know that our, when we target a certain number of learners to be given practical experience where potentially these projects will be and learn accordingly. Okay, on this slide, we're also asked to touch on issues uh, of uh, bursaries and internships. We're starting with the internships. These are the ones that have been uh, awarded or placed uh, in this financial year. Uh, the window that we advertised in July is still being finalized on the on its evaluation. So the numbers at this point in time is only 35 uh, in total, then spread between uh, the gender uh, spread. Um, next slide. The, this slide shows those ones that have been awarded, but recruitment is already in place, meaning they have not actually or physically started, but the award has been made for, for those provinces. 
um, Pumalang, uh, Northern Cape, Gauteng, and totaling um, 180, which we anticipate that uh, this by the next quarter, they will have started their internships. Next slide, talking to bursaries. This one uh, uh, talks to all the buzzers that we have at CETA, including our Tapeloma Dibeng buzzers, plus the ones that were awarded through DGs in the past. Um, we got 275, which then when it comes to buzzers, in this case, we are not doing well with our target of 51% female because of certain issues that uh, um, <coughs> are not just peculiar to the seats, 465 males and then 110 females. Um, Chair, I will be then moving to the next se section, which is the update on the Nehau allegations on governance and management at CETA. Just to bring the context uh, of the CETA and its uh, labor representation, uh, CETA has 106 full-time employees and, and 44 interns nationally. And then uh, Nehawi is the majority union at the CETA, meaning more than 95% of our staff are unionized and they belong to one union in Nehawi. We got a recognition agreement that was concluded some time ago that is still effective uh, at CETA that governs the relations and how we engage and address matters as prescribed in the labor laws of this country. And then in April, uh, there were allegations that surfaced in the media, and then there were also there was also a letter that was written by Nehau uh, to the department, the minister, and also the portfolio committee, to which then uh, uh, management uh, uh, was requested by the department, as uh, is duly appropriate, uh, to submit representation or responses. And management in April, I think it was on the 27th, we submitted a comprehensive response to both. Uh, the portfolio committee and the department in this regard. <clears throat> I'll talk later where, as we conclude on this matter on that. Uh, since then, uh, management has been working with employees and, and the union to build bridges and to improve on some of the employee engagement issues that were cited or were prevalent at the time. And then to date, the following initiatives have been put in place subsequent to these allegations that were made. Um, <clears throat> the CEO and the executive team engage on roadshows across all provinces, uh, which was the sessions that were facilitated by an external uh, expert to ensure that we create a climate of trust in our engagements. Those roadshows enabled the executive and the CEO to engage with all employees at all levels in round table setup where all issues were discussed in tables and then the solutions were proposed accordingly. Next slide. The roadshow culminated in the report where T 10 key findings as were well per the facilitator uh, were made. A roadmap with the seven initiatives was developed and shared with all employees in a strategic session that followed after those roadshows uh, beginning of August. And then uh, at uh, one of those strategic sessions that were held with the all employees in the organization, then uh, employees themselves nominated one CETA, one team committee members who will be assisting in the implementation of the recommendations from the roadshows, from all engagements and the issues that were cited as blocking the organization. And then uh, we are having uh, monthly bilateral and consultation meetings with Nehau to improve relations and ensure that matters are addressed timely. Uh, key to some of the matters raised uh, also in the roadshow, which has been a thorny issue, um, is still 
uh, was part of those allegations that the reports are not being released from the forensic investigation is the issue of the pension fund because it's got multifaceted uh, issues that uh, uh, need to be resolved around that matter. And then a pension fund committee has been appointed in this regard as was highlighted under operational committees supporting management. Uh, internal communication has improved with regular. We've got monthly staff meetings where all employees take part and participate and departments share their progress and the CEO reports back where the organization is and then, uh, yeah, uh, towards also taking uh, talk of where we are with regard to achievement of the annual performance plan targets and other strategic objectives in the organizations. We adopted as management that uh, we're going to be managing the organization with zero rumor hands to engage everyone so that they don't see things happening or hear from a grapevine, but from uh, uh, management and from everyone involved in the organization. And then management uh, from all the initiatives and uh, 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 processes that were recommended to be put in place to address certain issues have given itself a period of 12 months to, uh, to effect all improvements, which then uh, by June 2023, then a survey will be undertaken now to deep to see uh, and assess how effective were these interventions if they help to improve the organization since we believe that 12 months would be sufficient to, to give us that kind of a picture. Next slide. Um, okay. And then <clears throat> there were some of the things that were also highlighted from uh, the how allegations also confirmed during the roadshows engagements. Some aspects that are contributing to the unhappiness of staff was the issue of the organizational restructuring and development of what is known as OD process, which is the standard and the fundamental process when an organization is going through either a restructuring or as well as is known in our, in our space as administration. Uh, it was a recommendation uh, that the OD be done to restructure the organization and that resulted in some major unhappiness uh, in the organization, uh, which we understand as well, because it's a norm. There is no OD that will just uh, result in 100% happiness, but we are doing all we can to make sure that this process uh, is taken forward in an appropriate manner. As part of that OD process, the CETA embarked on, bench, on a benchmarking exercise last year, 2021, which these benchmarks were conducted by uh, OD experts. Uh, the, these benchmarks were benchmarking the salaries, the benefits, the structure of other CETAs and related entities. Uh, the CETAs that were benchmarked against were services CETA, MICT, MQA, ETDP, and Mercita. There were other smaller ones, but these are the bigger ones that we were uh, benchmarked against. And then, uh, historically, uh, before administration, CETA in 2019-20 had an approved organizational structure that was 56% of people in the structure were management, which included executives, senior managers, and management. And then during the administration, that was review as, reviewed as part of that uh, OD process, which identified or diagnosed that the structure was top heavy and needed to be reviewed against other CETAs as mentioned. And subsequent to that benchmarking exercise, then this current structure is made only of 12% management, which is a lean uh, management at the top, other than being top heavy. heavy. And then uh, just to indicate, uh, on this matter, on update of the how allegations on governance and management, um, there won't be many other matters that we couldn't uh, maybe highlight here. But for reference, uh, with submission, we did uh, resubmit uh, the responses and some of the supporting documents in case there is a, a need for such. Then, chair, we'll be moving to the to the next section, which is programs in support of a district development model. Uh, for us at CETA, in the rollout of our ERP project, where CETA partners with provincial departments and municipalities, the criteria for awarding
Apologies, Jefferson. I'm not sure what happened. I hope I'm back. I'm audible. We can hear you. Thank you. Apologies. Then as we, we implement the ERRP project, which covers mainly the short skills program learnerships and internships in the main, we then cover various districts in the province. For the current year, 2023, the targeted uh, ERRP rollouts were in the main, in the five provinces, with some we still in progress of making a, an award. Uh, was um, Pumalanga, KZ10, Limpopo, Northwest, and uh, Northern Cape, totaling 5,000 uh, learners that will be given opportunities at an overall budget of about plus minus uh, 90 million for the ERRP. And then uh, um, the table on the next slide then indicates what has been awarded, including the ERRP and the normal DG processes. We've got provinces uh, currently shown here in the main, which is KZ10, Gauteng, Northern Cape, Mpumalanga, Limpopo and uh, the numbers will be improving on the third quarter as we finalizing the Limpopo and Northern Cape allocations. The organization uh, uh, has been struggling with the Northwest, obviously with the certain issues affecting the province, which also affects the take and the rollout of the ERRP project in that province. Uh, we're still engaging with the province uh, to sort itself out in that regard. And then when it comes to others that were still in engaging with the provinces, is the Limpopo that we're finalizing, their engagements uh, to see which, pro which uh, district will be covered as per where the project will be happening as the, in the main, the provinces will fund the actual work and the CETA fund the skilling uh, portion uh, <clears throat> of those projects. So these are the provinces that we're currently in talk with, which is Limpopo Free State, and uh, Eastern Cape, which they, we are yet to finalize how much we'll be allocating in this regard. And then with the window, when it's awarded, uh, the status will change because applicants are from all over the country. When we do the awards, we also do an analysis as to which provinces, which towns, et cetera, uh, and then we'll be updating uh, our district uh, uh, spread in terms of our learning programs and skilling projects that we award. I think uh, the next should be the last slide, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, uh, that is about it that we could cover as uh, per the request. We then are with the direction. Thank you uh, very much, CEO. Can I check from the Chairperson, if there's anything else you'd like to add before I hand over to members. Yeah, maybe, thank you very much. Maybe let me also ask the my colleagues in the board, the accounting authority, Mr. Masimene, Mr. Villegazi, to, to kindly show face, please, and greet uh, portfolio committee members. Um, Mr. Masimene, Mr. Mr. Philip Villegas, do you want to just unmute your video quickly, just greet members, because I did indicate that I'm accompanied by yourselves in this for this purpose. Can we also stop sharing the presentation, please? It doesn't want to show a uh, chair, but uh, members of the board, including the portfolio committee members, good morning and uh, thank you very much, chair. That's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Masimene. Uh, okay. Maybe. maybe, maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, right. my, apolo okay. my apologies, I was, I was muted. Uh, uh, my name is Denny Masumeni, uh, the, uh, the board member at CITA. 
and good morning to Chair and Honourable Members and to my colleagues at CETA and the Executive Management. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, maybe just one last slight addition on my part is to say in relation to the matters that the CEO referred to around the normalization of the of the relations between the how and the and the and the executive management we i have been mandated by the board to ensure that this process is seamlessly expeditiously and urgently resolved because in an institution where employees are not happy and there is no cooperation and um, collaboration with management purpose of the functions for which people are employed, there will be collapse of services. There will certainly be the, 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 the lack of service delivery. We have then, I have then liaised with the office of the minister and as per his mandate to ensure that there are three persons aside committee, um, which excludes the, the, the CEO and the secretary on the how national secretary to resolve issues relating to them and to resolve issues relating to whatever antagonizes both uh, uh, stakeholders and ensure that this matter is resolved expeditiously. There is a process that is put in place, which process will zoom into the allegations in the 11 page document that was circulated and which the CEO referred to, so that we isolate legal issues, investigation issues, we isolate labor relation issues, we isolate uh, corruption related issues, we also isolate personality related issues and come to a resolution of this matter. I can assure this within a, a reasonable framework and time frame, we should be able to report back on this in terms of how far we have gone because as I can, as the committee would, would indulge, it is not in the interest of the organization to have such unresolved. Thank you very much, Chair. I will hand, hand, hand over back to you. Thank you very much uh, to the chairperson, the CEO of um, Construction uh, CETA. Um, I'd like to then hand over to members for their inputs, uh, comments, and questions. Okay, I'm just checking on the chat. Right, I see Honorable Litie, Honorable Mananiso. Okay, we'll note other hands as they go up. A number of members have indicated that they are having challenges at Acacia Park, but hopefully members will be able to make their remarks, um, those who really may be struggling, I think maybe we'll, we'll also look into the chat uh, if, if members can also use the chat to ask their questions or make their comments. All right, Honorable Litier. Yeah, Chair, I smell sabotage. My, my internet was uh, extremely stable throughout. And now when you are about <clears throat> to point, it says your internet is unstable. Like, that's why this thing is uh, chair are not uh, assisting us. But uh, am I still audible, ne? Yes, Honorable Itzia, we can hear you. No, oh, thank you very much. Um, I think it was Mr. Sonti earlier on who said, um, uh, on behalf of, um, the DG, they'll be able to answer our questions. We hope um, they will. Um, it's a pity that we don't have um, those who will be answering on behalf of the ministry. Uh, um, Chair, uh, good morning once again to <clears throat> yourself and uh, our colleagues, our capable staff uh, from Parliament. <clears throat> good morning to the board chairperson and the two board members who are here with him. Good morning to the CEO, Dr. Shazi and the senior management at the CETA. I am not sure if um, 
um, the unions are here, but if they are here, also good good morning to them. Chair, the the CETA was placed under administration in February 2020. The reasons provided then was that um, they had failed to execute the fiducious, fiducious. There you go. One other way I've been practicing it, uh, Chair. I think I must go back and practice once more. But fiducial, uh, fiducial or something like that, would um, I tried to change him. Um, Sorry, I think that's what you're looking for. Yeah, that one, uh, Chairperson. <laughs> um, they were placed under administration uh, because they could not exercise that um, uh, those duties uh, assigned to them. Um, but what were the, the what were those issues, Chair? If you remember, I want to. Remind yourself, it's because there was an issue with the uh, pension fund where when they presented to us uh, on the 26th of November, 2019, there was a physical meeting there in Max Building Chair. Um, the former CEO whom we had invited I think it was Ms. Pilusa, uh, would have made allegations that uh, she, she would have had a letter uh, from the board instructing her to do so uh, or to pay 100% or something to that tune of a pension fund. And the board, which was represented there by the former board chair and one board member. Um, unfortunately, I've forgotten the name of uh, the former board chair, uh, but the board member there who, had, um, who was also there was uh, Mr. Mfebe. Um, they, a chain that meeting disputed that they had given the CEO, the former CEO, um, the go ahead to uh, implement that change. <clears throat> um, and between December, January, and February, while we we're still on both recess and uh, constituency period, the city was placed under administration. Um, we interacted with uh, the CETA administrator for the first time in May of 2020, after he was appointed, uh, who indicated that he will be starting with a forensic investigation into the affairs of the CETA, uh, coming from the allegations of that board meeting that would have taken place in Deben, where there were apparently two letters, one giving instructions to the former CEO and one which the board were, were claiming was theirs, that did not. <clears throat> um, we informed that at the beginning, of 2021 or around that time, the forensic investigations uh, report will, will, will be available. I have not seen it, Chair. I'm not sure if you have. Um, <clears throat> so we don't have that um, forensic investigation. Uh, and hence, I was saying it would have been important for the DG and the minister to have been part of this meeting or the DG of skills so that they share this uh, forensic uh, report with us. But uh, we're told that the day Mabuza, 
uh, I think uh, he's, he's on the platform. Um, so maybe he can shed some light to us as far as that is concerned. How far is it? Uh, do they have it? Uh, how far is the process of implementation of that forensic investigation? <clears throat> but um, uh, when can they share it with us? And I want to propose that they share, share it with us on or before next week, Wednesday, which is seven days, so that we can go through that um, forensic investigations ourselves. Um, new board has been appointed. Uh, this new board doesn't have, um, so it's not a full complement has uh, vacancies of about five. Uh, and I'm assuming that uh, those who have been appointed um, met all the um, recommendations or all the, um, what is the right word? Uh, um, the, the terms of reference as they were in the Gazette. Um, <clears throat> that was um, uh, well, that volume 656 Gazette that was um, advertised on the 3rd of February 2020. Can um, Maybe Tete Mabuza again confirm if that is the case then when he responds. Um, the, the board chair says there are three members uh, who were in the previous board who are appointed in this new board. Um, can maybe not them, I think it would be unfair to ask the new board this or the CEO, but um, maybe in the Demabuza uh, uh, and uh, the office of the DG can respond to this one. Um, <clears throat> why are these uh, three reappointed into the new board when they were? disbanded in the previous board for according to the reasons given uh, when they could not execute their fiduciary duties together with their colleagues in the previous board. Um, that is an extremely for me, chair, important uh, questions for them to answer. Two, on the same breath, uh, in passing, the chair of the board <coughs> sorry, says that um, some members were not uh, Will not meet the requirement, and I'm assuming it's uh, members from other bodies in the um, constituencies that uh, are eligible to submit individuals, could not be appointed because they did not meet the requirement. Um, can they expand on that? What do they mean? Um, and can they be specific? If they say, for an example, uh, maybe let me make an example with uh, um, NUM because I see they are here. Wonder um, If NUM is allowed by law to nominate one person to serve in the board, and uh, they did not appoint that particular person that was nominated by NUM. What were the specific reasons 
if they are saying they don't meet the requirement, what, what exactly is that? Have they served more terms? They have, are they disqualified because of X, Y, and Z? Let them take us through. Uh, these five members who uh, I'm assuming are from constituencies that are legible to nominate. Um, <clears throat> What is the issue there? So let them, and, and Chair, I'm asking them to be specific. I don't want them to say, no, some of them, they had saved more, some of them, they say, eh, can they be specific? Um, uh, constituency A in construction uh, did not submit, or they submitted, but they submitted a demo who, um, um, was not legible because of X, Y, and Z. So that is what uh, I'm honestly asking here, yeah, Chair. <clears throat> um, the, the adverts for both have been advertised uh, more than once, Chair. Uh, they've been advertised like now, the last one for the five. Uh, I'm not sure if it's closing in September. I, I may have forgotten according to the presentation. Um, of course, uh, the, the entity man. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, the one that's just closing now or just closed now, it's not the first one. There, there was another one that uh, was advertised where uh, board chair and others uh, were nominated and subsequently appointed, but there was another one before uh, which was advertised and all of that. So can they quantify in monetary terms? Uh, how much have we spent on um, um, this advert and what were the exact reasons why we had to go and re-advertise. <clears throat> um, and then um, in terms of uh, certificates, uh, CEO, <clears throat> are there any learners outstanding certificates from the CETA? And um, if so, um, um, how many and, and from which period are still outstanding? And maybe also inform us what contributed to the certification backlog um, and what uh, mitigating strategies are you putting in place to address the certification backlog? And when can we say we have achieved day zero of certification backlog at the center. According to your presentation, you have targeted 3,500 skills program uh, entered for ERRP to be funded at 52.5 million. Uh, what skills program are targeted for this uh, economic recovery uh, uh, plan? And um, the white paper for post-education and training uh, proposed that where CITAS are funding uh, the provision of qualifications for undergraduates or, or postgraduates who are not currently employed in line with uh, sector priorities, uh, you should make a ring fenced contribution to the National Student Financial Aid Scheme instead of attempting to manage your own systems of dispersing funds to students. That's what uh, the white paper says. And last week, uh, Friday, uh, Chair, we were at NSFAS. And uh, NSFAS uh, raised uh, the issues of CITAS managing their own bazaars. Uh, now, I want to know how much does the CITAS spend in uh, managing its uh, own buzzer scheme. So the management part of the buzzer scheme, how much are we spending there? 
and whether a sitter you are considering allocating bursary funds to be administered by NSFAS. And if not, uh, maybe uh, take us through why not. Um, Chair, is the, this thing of mine just uh, uh, closed here? Yeah, somebody was, was I wrote my, my notes on the, on the phone chain. And when somebody tries to call me there, it's a it's a it's a it's a hassle. <clears throat> now, um, um, uh, yeah. Uh, on this advert that I was just talking about now, uh, which I think went on your website, it went up on the twenty first of September where you are calling for invitation for, for nomination to fill vacancies uh, in the board. Um, yeah, I just wanted to check, is the appointment of uh, board members as the CETA and ensured that there is gender equity? Uh, because currently in this meeting, um, there is three males who are in this meeting and zero females who are board members. So when appointing this um, um, board members, have we ensured that even on the advert, we are able to resolve the gender equity question. Um, and then um, <clears throat> the administrator was appointed uh, chair. Uh, and I apologize, my questions are just too many. Uh, but when the uh, administrator was appointed, some of the things uh, why, why he was appointed was to review the terms and conditions of employment uh, of the CEO, the CFO, and other employees on the CETA where necessary. To review, if, if necessary, all the governance policies of CETA in terms or in terms of any applicable, uh, suspend institute disciplinary proceedings or replace where, where necessary any of the officials of the seat and compliance with uh, any relevant uh, legislation. And if necessary, consult widely with the relevant stakeholders within the sector in order to adopt the standard constitution of the seat in terms of section 13 of the of the act and other relevant uh, legislation for approval and publication by the Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation. Facilitate the appoint of the new CETA accounting authority. Ensure the management of the CETA funds in liaison with the Department of Higher Education and Training in, in accordance with the relevant provision of the act. Uh, Public Finance Management Act of 1999 and the relevant regulations. Make rules relating to CETA and chamber meetings, financial matters and general procurement and administrative matters, which are in accordance with the provision of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa of 96, the, the Act or any other applicable laws. Now, <clears throat> Are uh, all of the above currently in place? Uh, if so, has there been any challenge, challenges with implementation? If not, why not? Um, and have, have all gov governance policies been reviewed uh, and, are, uh, and are they all being implemented? If so, which policies are those? If not, why not? Um, <clears throat> maybe I must end with this one, Chair, where we, we go back a bit and remind ourselves that um, CETA has been under administration two times. Uh, the first one was in 2011. Um, and in 2020, uh, it was also placed under 
administration. So CETA, when we look at it, it's a repeat offender of this thing of administration, which um, um, uh, chair allows us to be worried about the CETA uh, because the repeat offender. Um, uh, as the CETA uh, colleagues, are we confident? that this will never uh, happen again, meaning uh, the CETA will never be placed under administration again. Uh, and based on your answer, why do you think so? Uh, have you went to the reasons of 2011? Have you went through the reasons that placed the CETA under administration in 2020? And what is it that we're doing uh, in making sure that um, we don't go back into, into that path? Uh, what is our, um, uh, how do I put this thing, chair? Uh, sometimes in the school and education is a school um, <clears throat> based on your interactions with the Auditor General now, as they were auditing you for 21-22, um, what is your, how do you think you have performed as a CETA in the previous financial year? <clears throat> and uh, this financial year, when you look at your APP, and uh, where are we now? Uh, March, June, June, September, the end of the second quarter. Uh, are you confident that in this financial year, in the, the previous two quarters, we have performed well? We have, uh, there are no issues in terms of our own internal controls, uh, we're managing, the public funds uh, well in this current financial year. And if there were issues in the previous financial year with the AG, uh, have you been addressing them in this fund? So you had an ac audit action plan, which you are strictly following and making sure that uh, the AG now, when, he, when they audit you, there will be no recurring issues from the previous uh, from the previous financial year, um, <clears throat> and maybe 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 uh, lastly, chair, has there been any investigation initiated by uh, the national uh, the NSA into into your affairs? Uh, if yes, what is the status of the implementation and consequence management thereof? Um, and have any of those matters been resolved to date? Uh, are there any outstanding matters uh, that, needs, that needs to be resolved? If so, uh, why has it not been resolved and uh, how will this be, um, um, <clears throat> um, how will this be mitigated? And uh, Chair, uh, I, will, I, will, I would like to end here, but to also say that uh, I know some of these questions uh, chair uh, should have been directed to the minister, which is not here, and it's unfair uh, for us uh, maybe to send uh, these questions here. But unfortunately, there's no way we can ask them. Um, 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 so maybe, uh, chairperson, we must ask uh, your office, uh, chair, to. Um, to liaise with the office uh, of the minister, so that uh, especially on the issue of the forensic report. I mean, when a forensic report in, is initiated, there are, there, are, there are cost implications to that, because uh, there's no company just goes and do forensics without being paid. Uh, and those are public funds. And at least we need to get uh, this forensic report so that we are able to make our minds on, on them. Uh, so we still honestly, Chair, uh, I think uh, want to lobby you and your office uh, 
to reconsider us having <clears throat> this discussion with the minister and the department specifically on this uh, forensic uh, <clears throat> investigation. You might find that the forensic report says uh, the five other people who were not appointed uh, were guilty of one, two, and three, but we don't know. And the new chairperson doesn't know, and it will be unfair, so unfair on us to also ask him to answer there because uh, he, he is also appointed uh, through the same process as those ones who are not appointed. So it's not necessarily uh, him to answer to, but I'm hoping that somebody from the department will, will answer this one. But I think uh, Chair Wumas, uh, <clears throat> plead with your office uh, to get uh, us uh, with the ministry and the department, uh, both probably the DG and the DDG of skills <clears throat> on this issue of um, this forensic uh, investigations that were conducted and we don't we don't know what they say. Thank you very much, uh, Chen. I appreciate you being lenient with me on this issue. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Litsie. Honorable Malaniso. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, let me firstly start by actually acknowledging the presentation, Chairperson, and as well indicate further that uh, in most of the issues that relates to governance and policy issues, I've been covered by Honorable Litsie. However, one would want to make note of uh, the remarks by the Chairperson on the issue of zero rumor environment in the CETA. I think uh, the chair is inclined with uh, the discussions of this particular portfolio committee that we are actually driving the ideology of having zero, you know, uh, mismanagement of many things. So I think uh, it is important that he notes that we have noted that they are committed to ensure that there's a zero rumor space. And one believes that it can only happen if the, the environment or the working space is very conducive. So it is important that they strengthen their, their relationship with the union so that we don't get these rumors and uh, too much media attention that will make us be inward looking rather than focus on the service delivered. And I want them to actually note my disappointment with regards to their slide on internship beneficiaries. Uh, I was laughing when they were actually taking us through the presentation because I, 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 I thought that can be done by a youth office in the municipality. So they need to do more in terms of ensuring that they cater for many young people. Uh, that slide actually is very, you know, unbecoming for such an organization that you would have a uh, 10, a few people just benefiting. So it is important that they ensure that they create more internships or relationship with other stakeholders that they can assist them to have uh, more internships in the space. Uh, Chairperson, uh, on other issues, I'm partly covered by Honorable Lidzie, on issues of consequence management, and one would want to emphasize uh, that issue to say every time in this particular portfolio committee, we are always lamenting on it that people must make sure that they, they you know, people account. And I, I don't think that it's enough that every time we speak about accountability, but people, they cannot account. And if people, they are fair, they must tell us that people that have been employed or deployed, they are, they, they are not equal to the task. Because here it is not the space where people would always be, you know, taken for accountability on small issues. So I, I think they must come up straight in terms of showing us on their skills, uh, audit plan and as well the, the framework that they have if they have uh, right people in those spaces uh, so that at least as the portfolio committee when we do oversight we know that we're doing oversight on chain we cannot do one two three so we would like them to actually submit a skills, skills audit report to us so that we can scrutinize if uh, actually uh, 
Is there anything that is impeding on their work from a human capital uh, point of view? Uh, Chairperson, the other issue is with regards to the investigations as well. Uh, it's on the issue of Mr. Mputi did not have the required qualification, who then appointed him, and who should be liable for such an appointment? And are there any other irregular appointments of this nature in, in the CETA? What were the reasons for the extension of the administrator? And as well, has the administrator process been concluded? If so, is there reports available? Kindly submit to the portfolio committee with regards to that. Uh, Chairperson, the other issue is what has been presented by the CEO with regards to the ERRP skills to support the DDM in the Northwest. Can the CEO share with the committee what are the issues that he was actually relating to? So that if uh, as a committee we are able to intervene, we would do so on the happy house. Uh, and uh, Chair, on their slide with regards to their demographics of beneficiaries in future, can they just uh, uh, give us a simplified version, more especially on the age cohort? Because in this particular uh, unit, this is one of the units that we know that people who are 35 and above are benefiting. So I can they just give us a report in terms of that as well, so that we are able to check their age a, a cohort of beneficiaries. And lastly, Chair, can they submit to us a report with regards to the uh, local beneficiaries uh, who are being given uh, opportunities by the contact contractors as subcontractors? And uh, it must be shared as well uh, with specific demographics. And uh, one would want to emphasize, as I conclude, Chairperson, to say it's about time now that when we get audit outcomes, it's audit outcomes based on uh, safety delivery, not based on compliance or evidence that it would be submitted based on what is recommended uh, per the, the, the audit guidelines. So I just want to say to our people, let us not focus on yourselves, but focus to the key beneficiaries who are our constituency. You can do better than what you are doing now. And every time it is painful when we meet with sitters, hey, Isaiah Kala she, how sita we need to speak about irregularities. We need to speak about corruptions. We need to speak about incompetent people. And I think so far it is too much from us as members who are representing the ruling party that every time all of these things that are happening that are wrong in this particular entities they are being actually focused to the ANC as a ruling party. So people, can you just make sure that as you do your spring cleaning you actually clean the house perfect so that uh, we don't break the transformational agenda. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Mananiso and Honorable Lidzie. I can just have one second. Right. Uh, apologies for that, colleagues. Thank you very much, Honorable Mananiso and Honorable Lutze. I think I've by and large been covered um, by, by both colleagues and want to really reiterate the sentiments by Honorable Lutze and saying that some of these questions really, um, I don't think should be posed to the entity itself, oh, sorry, or the CETA itself, but to, to colleagues in the department and in the ministry. I mean, for example, in relation to um, the work of the administrator, we would need a report from, um, we would need the report of the administrator in order for us to understand what exactly uh, the recommendation, what exactly the findings are um, from the administrator and what the recommendations are in order for us as a committee to be able to um, play our oversight role on those particular recommendations, particularly because those are the recommendations that um, the, the new uh, board and um, 
uh, senior management would have to implement and that would be the basis of which we are then uh, monitoring their ability to turn the tide of the organization going back to the question that honorable Lizia asked to say do you think that you will be able to ensure that um, we don't have the CETA put under administration again noting that this is the second time the CETA would have been placed under administration and the only way for us to ensure that is through the implementation of the recommendations that would have come out um, from the administrator's report and and coupled with our oversight role in monitoring uh, uh, um, the work of, of the new leadership. Um, and of course, this is not to um, be, you know, our monetary role or monitoring roles rather, sorry, um, is to be of support and, 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 and guidance to the organization um, so that it is able to implement those recommendations and is able to actually turn the tide of the organization. And so it, it becomes uh, a bit tricky, you know, to ask the organization for, for, the, for, for the current leadership uh, to be the one solely uh, responding on this matter. And so I, I don't know, when we do hand over to colleagues who are representing um, the DDG's office or that particular program, um, maybe they will be able to to respond to some of those questions. But of course, uh, we are also limited if we don't have the, the report available. Just to um, hop on again to Honorable Malaniso's question around Mr. Uh, Dumisho Mputi, I think colleagues responded and I tried to see whether or not in your presentation, you were able to respond to this particular allegation um, that came out from the IOL news in, in May, 2022 around um, you know, um, Mr. Mputi's um, salary and the fact that uh, he, 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 you know, he doesn't have the requisite qualifications to be in that particular portfolio and be earning that salary. And so um, you know, were we able to resolve this particular allegation and look into it and, and, and then be able to um, you know, bring bring forth outcomes of, of 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 whatever investigations would have gone into that particular allegation. So, um, not only looking into you know the uh, perhaps I want to just backtrack that question a little bit further to say was that allegation warranted and did we look into that allegation and if and then going on to Honorable Mananiso's question to say if that allegation in, indeed stood, um, you know who is to to be held accountable for that particular appointment. Um, I think I'm a bit concerned that they, they, they you know, there have been allegations um, on, on Mr. Shezi's leadership. And I think, you know, when the chair speaks, he says, look, there's, 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 and when you look at the presentation, uh, perhaps there is justifiable resistance to to change um, and 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 you know there being um, new leadership uh, at 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 the at the um, forefront of of the organisation. Maybe there's resistance to um, whatever change in systems and in in, in organisational structure that 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 needs to be there as articulated in your presentations. And then there are elements, of course, of, of, of personalities and just, you know, Singabantu, your flesh. <laughs> um, but I, I'm, we, you know, maybe can't nullify the concern that one has on the fact that um, the leadership would have been appointed in September 2021, if I'm not mistaken. And by April 2022, there are already complaints. And colleagues have tried to allude to it um, in the presentation, I think as an attempt to respond, but, I, but, but really as a committee, we would appreciate being put into confidence on the work that we are doing to address um, and alleviate those concerns that may exist within the organization with the will of wanting to ensure that there's stability in the organization for the organization to be able to fulfill its mandate. 
um, I think there's a, a really massive role in a country that, 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 that really needs to strengthen its infrastructure development. And there's a number of in infrastructure development projects across the spectrum if we just solely focus on, on, on government. Um, or, or the public sector, you know, we, we want to build schools, we want to build roads, we want to build bridges, um, we want to build hospitals, we want to build student accommodation. And my thinking is that the citizens um, who should be going through our program are those who are going to be part of an ecosystem where they find themselves part and parcel of the construction of all these, all these key um, infrastructure development projects that we need um, to, 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 to develop our country. And so I think the CETA plays such an important role if you look at it in that broader sense. And so we want the CETA, like all other CETAs, to thrive um, and to be able to fulfill their core mandate, what they ultimately exist for. And so if there's any element of concern um, stemming from a reoccurring matter around leadership, around governance, around management, um, when we've just changed the, 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 the leadership of the organization and we have such concerns, it is worrisome. And we would want to, you know, nip whatever those issues are in the bud as quickly as possible. So I think um, it would be important for us to be brought into confidence on how, um, you know, we, we are dealing with those matters um, and to understand why those matters or th those, that form of allegation cannot be taken lightly because we wouldn't want to see ourselves going through um, a third administration. Um, I think all the other questions around officials, uh, around um, uh, questions that on, on Honorable Litsia would have spoken to around the work that the administrator was appointed to do and um, you know, whether or not the administrator was able to cover all those elements. And again, I think that's a question that can be answered by colleagues of, uh, from the CETA, but also needs to be answered by um, the, the department and, and the ministry. I uh, just want to check if I don't have... Thanks, Honorable Litsier, also for raising the matter around gender equity. Um, we, 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 we have a motor force, you know, within you, because uh, I think when I looked at the delegation, that's the first thing that came to mind um, in terms of representation, which I, which is absolutely pivotal. I mean, for a CETA like this, um, construction we know has a historic appreciation of being a very masculine space. Um, and so ensuring inclusivity and representation within it, the leadership of a CETA of this nature um, does have a direct impact on how we can, um, you know, uh, uh, address the, 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 the gendered stereotype of the sector um, of being a male dominated masculine uh, sector. So I think it becomes really important for us to ensure representation on that front. Um, I think I, I might have missed this chair, but um, just need to get clarity on the, the, the timeframes for us to have a fully composed um, board. If you can just reiterate that, uh, I think I probably missed it. Colleagues, I think let's leave it at this for now. Um, and then allow for colleagues from the, from the uh, organization, from the CETA to respond. And if there are any outstanding matters, um, then we will come back to them. Of course, on other matters that have been proposed by members, we will have to resolve on those matters as a way forward. For example, um, on the okay. request by Honorable Litsie to have the... Uh, forensic investigative report on um, the pension benefits matter. Um, that yeah, that, that I think we wanted that, that, that request was very long ago. Um, I think we would have to, yeah. So we would, we would want that report 
uh, submitted to us within the next seven days. And of course, even uh, going back to Honorable Mananisha's question, if the administrate, administrator's work has concluded, which, believe, which we believe sh could, should have concluded by February 2022, if we're not mistaken, um, then we would need to be finished with that report as well within the next seven days from the ministry or the department. Uh, so yeah, I, I heard okay. a mic go open. I'm not sure if someone was trying to come in. Yes, Chair. Um, it's, it's on a table. Um, okay, you may go ahead, Honorable. I must Honorable. apologize. I must apologize for for coming in uh, uh, late into your remarks. Uh, I just have a specific question on uh, some of the annexures we had received uh, from uh, the organization or the CETA. And specifically, I'm interested to understand, and this relates to the human resource aspect. Um, in a presentation, uh, send as an annex uh, presenting uh, pay grades. There is an interesting phenomenon in one of the reports um, in that the scales uh, of the pay grades have some form of a, a non sequential flow uh, in how uh, salaries or positions are graded in the organization. And some of the most notable are the B3 grade and the the E3 grade, and I would want to get some clarity on uh, what informs the medians. And I'm speaking about the CETA medians on the two uh, pay grades. The B3, the B3 grade um, compared to other CETAs, and I'm thinking they're benchmarking against the uh, industry norms, is, is almost four times as high as the norm, the median in the industry or in the sector, uh, to be correct. The E3 grade is uh, almost 75% uh, higher than the median uh, in the sector. But also interestingly enough, uh, the E3 median is also higher than the E4 median, which uh, if looked at in a sequential form and following logic, you would expect that E4 would be higher than E3. But also the same goes for B3, which is higher than the grades you would expect to be higher than it, uh, C2, C3, C4. and I would really want to understand why is, is this the case? And are there any uh, remedial, is there any remedial action being taken to ensure that these scales make sense? And because my worry is some of these things become a bone of contention between the employer and uh, representatives of uh, employees, uh, unions, in to be direct. Uh, what caused this uh, disparity um, in the median, the CETA median, uh, the, the construction CETA median, and what seems to be the sector norm? Perhaps if we can get uh, that response. And has uh, the union raised uh, questions around this matter? And if yes, how has it been addressed? If no, uh, what is the view of management and uh, the executive uh, in order to fix what I deem to be an anomaly? Uh, perhaps I can be persuaded otherwise. 
should other reasons be provided for this seemingly anomalous uh, situation? Uh, and that is uh, the questions I wanted to, to field, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. And the last one, uh, perhaps uh, without uh, letting it go to, uh, to bed without raising it, uh, what are the requirements or the prerequisites uh, in the implementation of the ERRP program <clears throat> and uh, by the CETA itself uh, for municipalities and provincial governments? What are the requirements? Uh, how do they uh, approve uh, programs from uh, municipalities? And I heard the CEO speak to the district development model uh, in some instances, you don't have uh, districts. You would also you would you would have metros, uh, but just a quick overview of what the requirements are and how they go through the approval process uh, for municipalities and secondly for provincial government in the implementation of uh, uh, their skills development uh, uh, targets. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Yabo. Uh, let me just check. There was a question from Honorable King. Um, so Honorable King has asked on the chat whether or not you have any challenges relating to stipends. And if you could kindly furnish the committee with the probity uh, report commissioned in January 22 on procurements made between April 2021 till November 2021. Um, I'd like to believe that those are then all the questions from members. Chairperson um, of CETA will now hand over to you um, and you will uh, delegate as needs be to the rest of your team on how you go about answering the questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Perhaps... Uh... <clears throat> What, what 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 I should do is to establish with uh, the representatives of the EA, the executive authority of the CETA, um, Mr. Ngubane and them, if they can start and deal with the issues, the legacy issues, which I we refer to as a historical issues that dates back way before the appointment of this current part of the accounting authority so that uh, we are then able to deal with issues that relate to what process appointment and subsequent. I will ask uh, Tobela, Chair, to deal with the, 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 the second last question that deals with E grading, B grading on the benchmarking and the implementation disparities and what the interaction with the union has been, because she's an executive manager handling human relations related matters. I would ask with. Um, uh, Mr. Pumzile, we are going to deal with the issues relating to the ERRPs and the targets, therefore, in the process, because it deals with project and uh, operational matters, he will handle the question by Honorable Member Chantel King that deals with the challenges around stipends insofar as they relate to the probity report and all other related matters. I will then ask the CEO to deal with the advert, the financial implications of the advert because it has been placed on um, the CETA website, it's been re-advertised quite a number of times. He'll then be able to as a final signatory of the 
financial related matters, he should be in the position to tell this committee how much the re-advertisement has cost. Members will have to appreciate that uh, <clears throat> the final decision, which is based on the regulatory discretion to appoint members into the accounting board lies with the minister, but the minister cannot do that without the recommendations or nominations which are made by the, by the constituency bodies. However, the Skills Development Act Section 11 in particular is prescriptive in terms of how the minister should exercise that discretion is not a absolute discretion, it's a discretion that's limited to the Skills Development Act, in which it explains who should constitute the accounting authority, it should be members drawn from the industry, representing various constituency bodies. And I would, in the process, it suffice to mention that in the current outstanding vacancy rate of the accounting authority, the advert has specifically mentioned that those whose expectation nominations should be made are three members representing organized employer, preferably women and black, one representing organized employee, I mean, uh, labor, preferably a person who's a woman, then one representing either professional bodies or the bargaining councils or community constituencies, and preferably the, a, a, a person who is a woman with an understanding that the, the idea is to, is to ensure that there's gender parity and representation in the board. I must also emphasize to mention that in the current version of the board, there are at least three board members who are women, one representing organized labor, which is the Bakau, the cow, one representing organized labor, which is the NUM, and he's, she's also a, 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 a youth and female, which is Sandra Masego, and the other one is Rehab uh, Moetela. Then we have in the current version of the port a woman representative representing the Department of Public Works. So from a gender perspective and parity in the board, I thought I should handle that part, Chairperson. Chairperson, I also need to mention at least one or two things that relate to the work of the Construction Education and Training Authority in relation to in contribution to the infrastructure implementation. You were correct, Chair, by saying that although it contributes to the infrastructure framework and development in the country, unfortunately, the Construction Education and Training Authority is not an implementing agent. It is, however, a strategic partner in ensuring that it facilitates the provisions of skills and capacity in the industry so that the industry can have a pool and a skill space from which to draw young people, particularly black women who are the majority in the country with the requisite skills in the construction value chain. Hence, the training and intervention programs must talk to learnerships, internships, apprenticeships, 
but we have also extended as per the operational plan and requirement the fact that these must also relate to entrepreneurship and build the capacity of these young people to be able to not just be employees upon completion of these programs, but they must be absorbable into the economy as employers. And then they must also be in a position to contribute towards economic recovery and growth of the country. An honorable member asked whether is there a time frame, it was yourself, Chairperson, on whether on the completion of the outstanding vacancies. I have indicated, Chair, that in terms of our work plan and envisage outcome, we would like to ensure that at least by next month, because there's a day 24 and 25th for the of October, in which we hope that by then, the full complement of the board will be in existence so that we can engage in what is called the high level strategic session. Which strategic session is going to plan for the next financial year and those until the expiry of this board term and set the vision and mission of where we want to be. But that strategic session will also have to re receive all the investigation forensic reports with their summaries, with their findings, with their recommendations and proposed action plans. It is against that background uh, that we will not be in a position, at least at this point in time, to be able to make available the plans of the board within seven days. However, I do know that as a matter of process, the board is already considering these reports, it's just that they need to be segmented into various um, recommendation, action plans, and, and, and findings. I will then ask the CEO and perhaps to a certain extent, Mr. Ngobane, deal with the issue that was raised by Mr. L uh, Honorable Member Letzia in terms of which he asked the question that why did the minister consider the reappointment of some and not others if according to how I understood the question, the minister was of the opinion that the entire board deserved or required to be disbanded for lack of fiduciary functionality. I'm unfortunately not in a position to be able to do that, but I'm sure that the, 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 the CETA support branch of the department will be able to articulate exactly the process right from the Gazette to the stakeholder nomination to eligibility, because eligibility is an important criteria for the minister's ultimate consideration of appointment. Although members are nominated by stakeholders, the, 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 the regulatory and, and legislative discretion, which of course is guided by section 11 of the Skills Development Act lies with the minister. And I'll ask the, the CETA support bench there to deal with that. Chairperson, um, yes, there's an issue about the bursaries as well. Uh, I'll ask the CEO and or the acting CE, CFO to deal with the issue of bursaries how we manage the bursaries as a CETA and how the management of those bursaries uh, has an impact in terms of the stakeholders uh, whose mandate it is such as your NSFs or such as your other institutions that are actually uh, supporting this, this program. I, would, I should also mention, Chair, that um, on our first two days of the induction workshop, this board reaffirmed its commitment to at least two things. One, ensuring that we reinstate confidence in the administration and the management of the CETA by ensuring that the processes between or the relations between the NAHAO and the management 
are expeditiously normalized and regularized so that they focus on the business of and serving the mandate of the city. Second is to ensure that there's quality output of our training programs so that levy payers who are primarily construction measured entities in the sector can then have confidence in growing its, 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 its contribution to the CETA by paying their levies. And hence the CEO made reference of the relationship between uh, the CETA and the CITP to the extent that we need to grow the pie or grow the pool of levy contributors so that then this CETA can go back to its glory days. However, you can't do that if relationships between yourself and the people who are supposed to deliver the services within the organization. And one honorable member did speak about the importance of doing what is called skills audit verification to determine your level of capacity within and ensure that you are able to carry out your mandate in accordance with your budget. One of the most difficult things that CITAS face across the landscape is the expectations for them to do more with less. And that actually does talk to your targets. You cannot, because the National Skills Authority is responsible to overseeing and monitoring the service level agreements that the CITAS enter between the department and the executive authority. And part of that is to make sure that target commitments, the meeting of targets is critical to those service level agreements so that people, CITAS don't under plan, but also don't over plan. We plan within the means available at our disposal, available at the fiscal that is made available by the National Skills Fund. So I will then give it to CEO to deal with those matters. If there are other matters I have not noted, I'm sure colleagues would have done so, then I'll give the other executive authorities. But let me check with Mr. Ngubane if he'd like to go first on the historical legacy issues, especially the issue of the, of the pension fund and how it was previously handled. It is a legacy issue. It is a, 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 a bone of contention in the 11 page demand by Nehau. It must be handled with the carefulness it, it deserves because it is at the end of the day, a legal issue, a labor relations issue. And if it needs to be ventilated in those labor relation forums, we may need to go there. But first we need to ensure that as directed by the minister, this is attempted at an organizational level, finalized, should there be no sufficient agreement in terms of what the way forward is, we need to find other mechanisms, but it cannot be dragging in the manner that it has and to the extent that it has now almost collapsed administration within the city. CEO, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I'm now joined uh, from the phone. Hope I'm audible. Am I audible, Chair? It's a, it's a bit shaky, but let's see how far we can go. Okay, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I heard from my chairperson that I need to respond on the part of the bursaries plus the issue of uh, that Mr. Nko was going to take the issue of reappoint of certain boards just to confirm uh, that I attend the accurate since I was kicked off by the of the team. Um, Chair, and then on set appointment of the board members, maybe to give an assurance that the returning oh, board I members, the history was... I don't know if it's possible for you to hand over to another colleague who can, who can assist, but we, it's not going as well as hoped for. For 
Chair, can you assist while, since you all are struggling in guiding uh, responses from different stakeholders, from different colleagues? Person, I see Mr. Ngubane wants to take, whilst the CEO is reconnecting, let's allow Mr. Ngubane an opportunity to then and deal with some of the board process appointment issues. Mr. Ngubane. Okay, please. Uh, can I kindly greet the chairperson of the portfolio committee and the portfolio committee members? Uh, chairperson of Construction Theater Board, the board members and the colleagues from the department. Um, let me apologize uh, again on behalf of the minister, the deputy minister, the DG and the DDG for skills development. During the beginning of the meeting, I had uh, technological glitches, so I could not uh, tender their apologies formally. Um, coming to the questions that were raised, Yes, the CETA was put under administration in February 2020 due to failure to execute its fiduciary uh, duties. That, manis that manifested uh, through financial mismanagement, in particular, the issue of payment of pension funds, which was irregular, which were irregularly paid. There were claims that were made by the former CEO to the portfolio committee on the 29th of November, 2019, that he got, or he was, she was executing the instructions from the board. On February, 2020, the CETA was put under administration because there were a lot of issues. The CEO and the board and the allegations against each other. So when the, the construction CETA was put under administration in February 2020. The administrator commissioned a forensic investigation to, ask, to ascertain the veracity of the allegations that were raised. There was a request by the honorable member, Lady, for a forensic investigation report to be shared with the portfolio committee. I can confirm that the forensic investigation report from the administration is available. It was shared with the chairperson of the CETA accounting authority for the new accounting authority to look into its content, the findings and the recommendations. The same forensic investigation report will be availed to the portfolio committee as requested by the honorable member. There was a question of what actions has been taken to implement the recommendations from the forensic investigation report. Let me indicate that the administration period ended on the 2nd of February, 2022. The accounting authority has just been appointed. It has undergone induction program, which was uh, conducted on the 5th of September, 2022. All the issues that are raised in the forensic investigation report, after this forensic investigation report been handed over to the accounting authority, the expectation is that the new accounting authority will look into the content of the report and come up with action plans to address all the issues that were raised in the forensic investigation report. But moreover, the administrator was appointed and was assigned to execute specific functions, which were articulated in the government gazette on his appointment. At the end of the administration period, the administrator prepared the administration close that report, which was submitted to, to the department. The same administration closeout report is the document that will also be guiding the new accounting authority on the pending issues that were identified during the administration period, which were hindering or compromising the governance of this organization. 
The expectation is that based on the close out report, there will also be action plans that will be developed by the accounting authority that has commenced its duties. Having the, account, having the newly appointed accounting authority been inducted, we believe that they are in a better position than to begin with their responsibilities because they have been orientated with regards to what their functions are in execution of their fiduciary responsibility, as well as the expectations from the department. So in short, the forensic investigation report, as well as the close out report from the administration are the documents which are a starting point for the new accounting authority that has just been appointed. Coming to the issue of the appointment of the accounting authority members, the honorable member, honorable Lacey, indicated that he hoped those appointed uh, meet the criteria for appointment. The appointment of the accounting authority members is regulated in terms of the Skills Development Act, Section 11, as well as the CETA standard constitution. The Skills Development Act clearly stipulate the eligibility criteria for the appointment of the accounting authority members. Among other things include the criminal record checks that must be conducted to members before they are appointed. Their nationality or citizenship must be verified that the member that has been recommended is a South African citizen. They are expected to clear their interest or the conflict of interest or an indication if the appointment may have any uh, conflict of interest. Their qualifications also need to be verified by South African Qualifications Authority as well as their seniority in the nominating organizations that is recommending them. So with the current 10 members that has just been appointed, the eligibility criteria has been checked and they were all found to be meeting such eligibility criteria. On the point regarding the three members who are coming from the previous board being appointed in the current accounting authority, let me indicate that the appointment process was guided by the eligibility criteria which is provided in terms of the Skills Development Act 97 of 1998. The members were nominated by the, their constituencies within the construction sector. But from the department's side, the decision to reconsider such recommendations was based on the importance of ensuring continu continuity, institutional memory, as well as their experience in the board, in particular with the construction sector board. The AA members which were not appointed because of not meeting the criteria, there was a question regarding that. I will request the CEO to also assist in that particular question, but that question was noted. There was another question regarding a quantification of how much has been spent in the advertisements as well as uh, the outstanding learner certificates. I'll also request the chief executive officer to assist giving the answers to that. There was a, a point or a question raised by honorable lady on the CETA being put under administration twice in 2011, as well as in year 2022. The question was whether we, the department is confident that the CETA will not be put under administration again. I think the reasons for putting the CETA under administration in 2011 are different from the reasons for putting this CETA under administration in 2022, but they all uh, point to the lack of good governance within the organization. So I can't answer with certainty that the CETA will not be put under administration again, but I can say that if there are any reasons that point to the need for putting the CETA administration, I think 
as guided by the legislation, the Skills Development Act. That may need to be considered. But as we stand, the CETA was put under administration. The administrator conducted the forensic investigation. That gives us a sense of what banning issues and what governance shortfalls that it needs to be attended to. Again, the closeout report also sums up all the issues that it needs attention by the new accounting authority. I think we will all agree that the administration period is not enough to turn on or to turn the organization around. It is just a period to put all the systems and processes in place to ensure good governance, as well as the continuity of the organization. And part of the administration functions or responsibilities was to appoint the accounting authority that has just been appointed. We have confidence in the accounting authority that has just been appointed. Having uh, subjected them to an induction program on their responsibilities and having recommended all the source documents for their reference in order to be able to understand how the CETA business works. Also appreciating their experience uh, in conducting a governance of the organizations. But we believe that there are key documents that they need to refer to in order to come up with the action plans that will assist the organization to move forward. That also covers the closeout report, as I've already said, as well as the audit action plan. Because if we look at uh, the Auditor General's reports, you will see that the organization during 2017 and 2018, 2019 and 2020, it was stable with unqualified audit findings. Then it went down to get a qualification. During the time of it being put at an administration in year 2020, it had uh, received an unqualified audit opinion, but uh, that unqualified audit opinion did not mean that the organization was properly governed. That is why it was put under administration. Uh, furthermore, on whether we are confident that the CETA will not be put under administration again, so I've covered the issue of the audit action plans to address AG findings, which we expect the executive team of the CETA, as well as the accounting authority to look closely into those and also have them discussed in every accounting authority meeting just to track progress of the audit action plans that has been developed. As the department, we have requested all the CETAs to submit audit action plans to address the AG findings especially the CETAs that got unqualified audit opinions. Furthermore, the minister has recommended that a task team comprising the departmental officials, the CETA management team, as well as NEHAO, be formed to look into all challenges that are facing the CETA, more especially on the issues that uh, relates to employer, employee or union uh, issues, with the intention to come up with an action plan on how they will harmonize the relations within the organization. The first meeting took place on Friday last week. The task team has been given the marching orders to look into all the issues and the allocations that were raised by Nehau. And this coming Friday, the expectation is that the task team will meet again, uh, hoping that the team members, including the accounting authority members, will have had a chance to peruse the content of the allegation so that we can be able to come up with action plans to address all the issues that has been raised. But on top of that, we are confident that the construction CETA executive team is also playing their part, given that already they've began with stakeholder engagement roadshows in order to build the stakeholder confidence towards the organization. It's normal that when the CETA is put under administration, even the stakeholder confidence gets eroded. So with those stakeholder engagement roadshows and also 
by the CETA collecting all the views from the stakeholders. The CETA will be able then to come up with, with uh, the interventions to respond to those. And the, the CEO indicated in his presentation that they managed to note 10 pending issues from the stakeholders. And they came up with the seven item action plans to address those. There are already the bilateral meetings with Nehau, which are taking place within the CETA, which we hope that the CETA will be able uh, to move forward with its governance improved. Coming to the issues that were raised by the honorable member, honorable Mananisu, he asked as to the reasons, she asked as to the reasons for the extension of the administration period twice. When the administrator was appointed, the initial appointment was for the duration of 12 months. There were specific activities or functions that had to be executed by the administrator. During the end of the administration period, there were key milestones that had not been achieved by the administrator, which are very important for the running of the organization. One was the appointment of the chief executive officer. It will not be appropriate for the administration to be ended while there is not even a chief executive officer in place to run the operations and the leadership of the organization. The second reason was that the administrator was also given a, a duty to engage all the stakeholders in order to discuss the constitution and adopt the constitution in consultation with the stakeholders. So those two issues, the appointment of the CEO and the consultation for the approval of the CETA constitution had not been conducted. Although there were some other milestones that were not achieved, but these two milestones were those which were seen as critical for the management and the, uh, the leadership of the organization. That was one of the reasons uh, the administration was extended twice. That, that, those are the reasons. If the administration has been concluded, yes, the, the administration was concluded on the 2nd of February, 2022. We do now have the accounting authority in place. Uh, there was a, a question on the appointment of a member without qualifications. I did not properly get early that question. I would kindly request the honorable member to clarify that question. I did not want to interject when he was, she was still raising her questions. And then on the allegations about the leadership of the CEO, I will just make a comment that when the organization is, trans is transitioning, from the administration. Firstly, when the, CETA, the organization is put under administration, there will always be uncertainties within the organization. Because you find that there is even a resistance from the employees themselves. But after the administration and when the CEO was appointed, I believe that was also the same feeling from the organization. But with the accounting authority being appointed to oversee the running of the organization, the expectation is that the accounting authority will be managing or will be providing oversight and the CEO will be reporting to the accounting authority. So if there are any issues relating to the leadership of the CEO, the accounting authority is in place to manage the performance as well as uh, the functioning of the chief executive officer. Again, let me reiterate as I end that with the task team that has been established uh, to ascertain the veracity of all the allegations that were raised uh, before the accounting authority was appointed. We are expecting that a roadmap uh, with a list of the action plans on how all those allegations will be addressed uh, will be compiled and will be managed closely by the accounting authority 
the expectation from the department side is that from time to time, that task team must report it to the executive authority. Thank you very much, Sherperson. If there are any issues I might have left out, let those be raised, but I will kindly request to you, Sherperson, that the chief executive officer be allowed to deal with other questions that were raised. Thank you. Great. Can we check if the CEO is back? Thank you, Chair. I am back through the phone. I'm not sure if it's going to work this time. Are you experiencing load shedding, CEO? Yes, I'm not sure that the, the network is dead almost. Okay, I, we had hoped you may have tried to move, All right. um, but uh, it, it still is quite bad. Um, can you just give me one second, CEO? Try and find a drive towards a different location that could possibly have better network. And whilst we do that, I think we have received the response from Mr. Ngubane. Um, but perhaps if there are other colleagues, um, other senior managers who need to respond, but I do know that we do have um, follow up. There are requests for follow up questions from members. But I also want to really plead with the CEO to try and find a way to move from his current location. Um, I, I, I don't know, but yeah, um, yeah because no, we thanks, can't chef. the CEO. No, you're right. Thanks, yeah. Chef, for your direction. I had indicated that there are some issues that um, some executive man managers can attend to in the meantime. And uh, can I, through your permission, request that they do so? Um, so that why is this who find is reconnected? Okay, that's fine. Can you direct as as needed, uh, Chair? Oh, well, do you want to start with those issues that are HROD remuneration related? <clears throat> Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, um, Chairperson and members of the of the committee, uh, colleagues from DHEAD. I was requested to respond on the issue of the pay scales. The pay scale report was commissioned during administration prior to the OD process being implemented. Therefore, these salaries that were benchmarked against the salaries of other CETAs were the salaries that the administrator found in the CETA. Yes, we do agree that there are anomalies in the pay scales. And these anomalies, we believe, were caused by not following proper processes or a structured approach when offering um, salaries on new or incoming employees. So what would normally happen? is that if you're appointing someone at 
level B3, job level B3, you would have to ensure that the salary that you are offering that uh, incoming employee is within that salary scale or salary band. What has happened previously is that when people were offered salaries, the pay scales were not reviewed to ensure that the people were being offered salaries within the pay scales of their job levels. This is what has caused these anomalies. There are recommendations that have been made to normalize the situation. And these recommendations include the freezing of salaries, the benchmarking of jobs with other CETAs, and validating the job grades um, of the jobs within the CETA. The management felt that before implementing these recommendations, that this report be formally presented to the committee of the board dealing with remuneration and HR matters so that they would provide the guidance and leadership on how they want to implement these recommendations that have been made on how to normalize the situation. So that is how we have found ourselves at this point. It is true that uh, there are anomalies in the pay scales. It is true that the CETA is paying significantly higher than other CETAs but we wanted this matter to be resolved between all stakeholders, including the board. I hope that I have responded adequately to the question, but if I have not, um, I, can, I can return to it. Has the union raised the matter of salary disparities? Yes, it has. And uh, this is the response of management is that we want to allow the board to look at these issues through its remuneration and HR committee and provide leadership and guidance on how it wants to implement these recommendations that have been made with regards to normalizing the salary scales. Thank you. Chairperson Masombuka, um, um, I'm not sure if I've responded to everything that has been asked with regards to the pay scales. I don't know if we've also lost the chair now. Yeah, no, it's fine. Just do that so that we're able to analyze it. I don't think it orders very well. Okay, I think the chair was trying to use with the CEO. Yeah, no, 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 no. Sorry, chair. I was just on the phone with the CEO trying to tell him to what to do so that he gets back online quite urgently for us to be able to dispose with the issues that require his input here. He's been there has been an issue about leadership and concerns since um, since uh, the appointment in September 2021. I think only the CEO can be in a position to answer and give confidence to those issues. But there has been issues, um, Tom Bella, and I don't know if the acting CFO is with you there, which was asked by the honorable member, let's say, regarding bazaaris and the administration. There has been, I think the CFO should be in a position to ask, answer this. How, how much have we spent on the re-advertisements? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, I think Mr. Ngubane has articulated the process and the qualification criteria very well, but we need to give the committee certainty on why we have been uh, re-advertising to the extent that we have and how much of financial implications that uh, had. And there was an issue around uh, is it economic recovery programs and the extent to which we're able to participate in those programs to, to, to support the construction industry? And, uh, and yeah, uh, acting CFO, please attend to those. All right, Chair, thank you very much. Okay, Chairperson, I will come in from Zulayago. Um, I'll take the questions that are relating to UN projects. Basaris is part of that uh, in the context oh, of yes. the yes, commercial part. Yes, then I'll, yes, I'll just including the stipends. Why no? should I only be going to the stipends and the probity report? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, members, uh, honorable members of the portfolio committee. 
Uh, I will take the, the questions. One of the questions I'll take first is the question on certification, where it was, are there any outstanding certificates? And what are the causes, if any? And then have we put any measures in place if there, there is? Uh, Chair, we do have outstanding certification, or maybe to say we are not certificating at the time that we should be after the project has been completed. There is an historic element to it that has caused this, um, that we are not on time. So in terms of the causes, for example, we had the, the issues of data management, which at the beginning of the year, if we just look at the instability of CETA around staff, it has also affected a lot then in terms of us finding what kind of data, what might have happened in the past as well. So that has also delayed. So we kind of related, uh, relied on them when we hear people that were raising complaints about delays. We also then had issues around the, because part of the certification, the last leg before you certificate is the external moderation that we do. We've also picked up then that in terms of that issue of that process, it's when we picked that there were non-compliance issues on the learners that were in the system. Because the process dictates that as you register a project, you register the learners concerned, you attach certain documentation. Uh, so, but that was part because we realized then at the end that uh, there was processes. So most of what was a backlog, when we looked at it, trying to clear, we find that actually there's still work that needs to be done. The responsibility of that being shared by both the providers and ourselves, because on our side, we should have just made sure that on time, we have sorted the issues that we needed to, to sort. Uh, but in terms of then, then in terms of the, the projects as well, there's an element of non-funded, meaning that the, the role we are certificating there for non-funded. We've also had a challenge that, that delayed that printing in the sense that uh, the providers or the employers that are doing the non-funded uh, component would then show up or start interacting with us when it comes to external moderation, then we would have to go back and start the process because before you can moderate, we need to make sure that the learners are on the system. Uh, we've also shared that as a result of the OT process, had the challenges of few numbers of staff because the staff members in the unit were reduced uh, from the complement that they had, but the process itself is manual. Now, to measures and also as I'm saying this we've already put measures in place so one of the measures we've put processes and templates on the moderation process so that as you finish the moderation process you are then able to use the numbers of the competent learners to be ready for certification but we've also had measures then that uh, because previously as well the police would then go for a moderation activity without first doing the verifications on the system if everything is okay we've allowed system access for the colleagues across the provinces to first verify before going so that we don't go there and notify after that there are issues. That is then clearing at least so that when you go to certification, they can just focus on printing of certificates. Uh, we've also provided a training as well in NQF level four, just to make sure that the colleagues are understanding it's a bit of a specialized uh, space. The, then we've asked HR to allow us to do a bulk uh, the training for, for staff members in particular like to and projects so that we, we, we can then make sure but one of the things then that after struggling with the data I think as the staff is settling we've managed now to be able to at least pick up from the moderations that were done in the past so I've got resources that are constantly working to try to say all the moderations that were done in the past uh, we've got a tracking tool where then the, the certification team is running through that to just make sure that we are certificating. At this stage, excuse me, it has focused from the beginning of current year, but we've, we've finished that part now. We are moving towards the last year, uh, which is currently in the quarter four and quarter three. So we, we, we are taking, but to some extent as well, we've allowed the colleagues from the provinces so that when in terms of their interactions, they are picking up that there's something or someone is saying they've not been certificated. So we pick that, but the reality is historically, as you go backwards, our systems do not allow us to pick that, but we, we, we've turned the corner. Also on the resourcing, we've added more resources now uh, because for a while we still had maintained the, the two resources that we've had. We've added uh, from other units now currently three more, three more members. 
as well as three more members that are just assisting on the administration side so that then the guys that have got the rights to actually print certificates, they can focus on printing certificates and that. So that, those are initiatives that we've got. Uh, the other question, Chair, was on the short term skills on the ERP, asking what is it that we are training for. The, for the 20, 21, 22, all ERP were focused on the road construction uh, that were done across provinces. For 22, 23, the, with the engagement we had with the minister as well as the, the head, uh, we were directed then that the pathways needs to be opened in terms of what we do in ERP. So we currently do learnerships, also do apprenticeships, we do TV placements, also candidacy. And uh, most of the actual then focus areas we are looking at there, we're still focusing on, uh, on road construction, plumbing, so across all the pathways, uh, bricklaying, construction management, civil engineering. Also, then if you look at the, uh, in the professional level, we quantity survey and architects and civil technicians. These as well are being driven by what we've recorded as car skills in terms of our SSP. Uh, I think the other question, the other question was on the Basari. Chair, we currently, the Basari is, uh, we've got a service provider that is administering the whole discretionary grant uh, process, uh, meaning receiving applications, evaluating, or maybe compiling because we still do the evaluation and making sure that the, the, everything went well. So part of that is the Basari, because Basari is full as part of that um, discretionary grant funding. So as a result of that, they get involved in the administration, maybe that's the right word. The cost then from that service provider, but once then they are going to that. But I also want to say, Chair, there's areas of improvement in that. Uh, maybe fortunately for this year, we, the, the, the numbers for this year will be implemented early in the year. But we are in discussion and consideration in terms of how can we be efficient. This one of the big questions is with the infrastructure that's already available, like universities, and I'm taking note of the NSPAS now, which we can just add as well as part of our engagement to see how do we use those existing platforms to then administer Basara. Because in its nature, it's a bit different in terms of how we do other things. So there's that that we're working on. We will look at the NSS rule as well, but there's intention to use the existing so that then we're not having to invest a lot in doing that part, but we can just make sure we are managing and the recruitment part as well, the approvals and all those. Uh, I think the other one was comment on internships, which we will gracefully acknowledge uh, about the numbers. Also on the report, the issue of the age, which we, we, we can provide for the future. Uh, the other question, Chair, was relating to whether there's problems in payment of stipends. The payment of stipends, there is uh, problems in payment of stipends in relating to the payment on, in, to the payment on time. We would really want to be getting a guarantee of a day of payment for, for stipends, but I must admit, uh, we have not been able to get that. But one of our biggest problems we've had in terms of the current system is that we are more reliant on the providers first after the month end, giving us the proof of attendance by learners. Then once we get the proof of attendance, we must still look at that and analyze and make sure. Also, it has become quite a manual process that has then also contributed to the time that we take. We are also then in the process to just take that out of our system. We are in the process, we've implemented actually a system, it's just that it is not fully uh, running the whole population currently, where its purpose is to manage the time so that then at the end of the month, we can just print a report of attendance and literally pay. And with that, we are targeting to be paying every first day of the month, which we think then is gonna take a lot of manual, but while we're implementing that was system implementation, we, we may not be able to rush it through, we're taking it step by step, but also because of the nature of the projects that are ending in different times. So we are watching when the ones that still have time so that we can practice a lot 
Nonetheless, also whilst we are on the manual, we've also then involved our provincial offices just to assist in terms of the reviewing of the time attendance and all that, so that whilst we, we're doing that, so we're running parallel processes at this stage, just to really improve in that space, understanding the impact of the delay or not getting on time the, the, the stipend. Uh, the other question was, what are the requirements for participation on the ERLP check? Currently, the, and the approval processes uh, within CETA, I took it like that. Currently, the model we are using for ERLP, it is the special project. We do have a special project policy. We also do have a DG policy that is reviewed every year. Part of the provision of that is to allow special projects. So ERRP in the main, we run it as a special project. So one part of it is where we are approaching and the approach, uh, we're approaching provinces and the approach is to have interactions with the offices of the premier. The reason for that is because we are looking at the spread across the provinces in terms of opportunities. I think like Rocio indicated when he was presenting what we try to, we are doing in fact, we're not trying, is to then get a sense what projects are on the ground. When are they, how long are they gonna take? Uh, then if we want to skill them, what are the opportunities? So that's the engagement we do. That allows us then to get a spread across the province, which is why we're saying, at least for the district model, this is where we are able to find. But there's also then an element, so in the main, that's how we are rolling that. Then in terms of, there's also an element then where we could be approached. If you approach us, for example, then you fit the extent of us meeting or having projects, meaning in the context of a municipality, you could be having projects, but the criteria is one, show us where the projects, but you have beneficiaries, are you capable of implementing? Uh, but are you in the ground in a sense? So most of this, we are, we are running it in the other, in the provinces, but looking at the districts. The approval process, whilst we did not have the, what the, we would re receive, okay, In terms of then how the process must work, how would we, what are we looking for and all that. Then that particular province will go and look and help the provinces that got across districts. Uh, and then we will evaluate that eventually. And then they'll tell the numbers that they're able to scale. We also use our office, provincial offices then to support that process. Then eventually we look at that and then we award in terms of that. We don't always award all the numbers that are required, but sometimes numbers come quite high particularly because we are protecting that the cake is spread across the country. Then when that is done, then we, we've got a special project office that then they write the, the motivation from what they see, just checking that it's aligning. And then via myself as an executive, the approval was then done by the CEO. Uh, that was when we didn't have a board. Currently with the board, all the DG awards, whether special or relating from the advertised one, will be approved by the board. Uh, Chair, I think those are the questions that uh, I wanted to, 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 to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yego. I hope the issues, the probability report and all that has been covered. Chair, I managed to get hold of the CEO. He's now able to join in and uh, attend to the questions that relate to, uh, to answer the questions that relate to uh, is 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 spectrum co i'm still on my road to the to the school unless i'm audible now you are yeah. audible co okay. yes, you are just I'll just, just go ahead what is about time what about time give me just two minutes all right can do while he um works on becoming stationary is just go back to Honorable Littier who has follow-up questions. But also I think on my side, what I must indicate, Chair, is that I think um, just in your, in your, in your opening res remarks as you responded, you emphasized the fact that you, your responsibilities are not necessarily to, to do the training. Um, and I think that's, that's fully understood. But I mean, if we are allocating funds to um, to, to, to organizations, companies, um, individuals to train 
um, on our behalf, we need to ensure that what the, the training programs that young people in this country are receiving are in are responding to the infrastructure demand and trajectory that our country should be taking or needs. I mean, let's look at, for example, um, the recent floods in KZN in the Northwest and the Eastern Cape. Um, a, a lot of conversation manifested there around uh, spatial planning, around town planning. But even when we speak about um, the housing that may have come from government, that comes from government, um, we need to be ensure or buildings or infrastructure that belongs to government. We need to ensure that the skills that these young people are being trained on, the funding that we are releasing to ensure that these young people are being trained, those skills are responsive to the trajectory that we want to take in terms of infrastructure development in our country. So that's what I meant. And I think I needed to clarify that um, uh, um, because we, you know, it, it, our biggest concern as a community okay. is that we don't even know who is doing the trainings. Can someone, who's, the person whose mic is on? Okay, I think it's the CEO. Um, let me just, can we try and help the CEO to mute, please? So that's that. That's the, the the point we were moving from. And then in relation to uh, the question around um, uh, Mr. Dumisho Mputi, I think there was a colleague who said they did not hear what the question was. Um, the question that was covered mainly by Honorable Mananiso and myself was that we need to be brought into confidence that those allegations that this particular person did not have the requisite skills to hold that particular position were addressed. Was it true that he did not have those particular skills? If it's true, what was done to rectify that? And how did we even, Honorable Manisa even takes it further to say, how did we even get to that particular point where we had someone who did not have the requisite skills in a particular position. So that is the question in relation to Mr. Dumishom Puti. I hope we have given the CEO sufficient time to um, become stationary and therefore respond to the outstanding questions. Oh, sorry, before I go back to CEO, let me come back to you, Honorable Itzi, and then I'll hand over to um, the CEO. Thank you very much. Uh... Chairperson, I um, felt that I might, I might not have been heard. Um, maybe it's because my video was off. Um, so I want to maybe start with uh, the problem with using one gadget uh, by our colleagues in the department is that when somebody else speaks, you don't know exactly who is responding, but there was a, a gentleman now responding on the issues of um, uh, um, certification uh, issues and um, uh, the stipends. Maybe let me start there. Uh, chair one. Um, I think the issue of certification cannot be stressed enough. When we have trained people for, for a particular um, um, skill and we don't give them certificates, why are we spending so much money uh, training that person? Because um, the logic here is that was we're, we're training you so that you go and contribute in the in the economy. But without certificate, that person can't. We know they can't get employment. Uh, whatever they can present as as um, as um, <clears throat> as a skill that they have, the potential employers will not take it because they don't have papers to show for it. Now, on to so it's, a, it's extremely important that after training anybody, we, we, set, we certify them. Uh, according to uh, that gentleman, and I apologize, I did not hear his name. 
uh, but uh, he was speaking on uh, his, uh, um, um gadget. Uh, and if the CEO is on the phone, is on the platform now and uh, is able to hear, I want to suggest to them that they must go put up a plan uh, to certify people on time. Uh, and this plan must look at um, those who have um, um, well, graduated uh, who, who uh, were not certified, uh, were not certified. Those who will uh, graduate now, at the end of the year, and put up a plan on certifying on time those who will be graduating moving forward. This thing, I don't know. We uh, we did not really have a plan to certify on time. No, that one won't help. Number two, Chair. Uh, they also speaking about that they are paying on the first of every month, the stipends, uh, after receiving attendance registers and all of those things. We are firmly almost at the exit point of the fourth industrial revolution almost at the ex exit point. And we did say this thing, Chair, um, when we had the MICT CETA with us some time back, we said uh, this CETA must find a way of collaborating with one another for better solutions. And we said, because MICT, is in the ICT space. They must find a way Richard, it seems that Honorable C has been cut off. Yeah, I think uh, the MICC guys ought to immediately send agents to deal with Honorable. <laughs> now that he was <laughs> now that he was placing them firmly on the <laughs> on the scene of crime. Uh, All right, let's have Honorable C um, reconnect, and then Honorable C, yeah. I know you had hope to keep your camera on, but maybe let's uh, switch it off. Sure. sure. Um, I don't know what happened. My 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 computer just locked off uh, from the Wi-Fi. I don't know why. For some reason, just decided to do that. Uh, Chair, I was saying, um, maybe let's use, uh, uh, utilize each other's skills in the sector. Uh, to better deal with this thing. Those things are on the market. They are not expensive. They are cheap. Uh, let's use them to our advantage. Um, <clears throat> and then to the questions that I would have asked earlier on, which Dr. Ngubani attempted to answer. Uh, you know, Chair, when I asked those questions, I said, Maybe those questions should be answered um, by the by the political leadership of the department and maybe the DG. But Ndaten Gubani decided to answer. But when he answers, Chair, I'm not sure whether it was um, because of my uh, uh, English I used. Uh, I'm sure, Chair, we all understand that uh, even the nomination for a board is guided by some acts, by legislation. The appointment is guided by legislation. We know this. We know this. We, we even said um, uh, this legislation allows 
the constituencies in the prime in the in the construction sector to nominate. I can't be nominated there when I'm not in the construction center because we understand that it's guided by this um, legislation. Our question, chair, or questions were were clear. Uh, our questions were clear. The board was put under administration. And the reason is that uh, these board members did not exercise their fiduciary uh, duty. They are in the board now. What is the implication of this? What are you saying? Don't tell us that they were nominated by 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 their constituencies. Uh -uh. So what were we trying to when we say when we are choosing a board member of not exercising their fiduciary duty, and then we appoint we reappoint them, and then we say no, it's because they are uh, um, nominated because. They are nominated by their constituencies because legislation allows. What are we trying to say? What are we? So it means tomorrow I can be accused of very serious uh, uh, crime, um, um, but because uh, um, being a member of parliament, you must be uh, coming from a list of a political party. You must come from. A, a constituency. Uh, uh, that's not how it works. If uh, there, there were there were allegations against, and this is what I was asking, and you have not answered that question. Um, if you want to answer it, answer it. But if you can't, maybe let's leave it. Let's not uh, chairs and patronize one another yeah, and tell each other about <clears throat> legislation A, B, and C that says a person can be nominated and therefore uh, they are now appointed. Uh -uh. Let's not patronize one another. Number two, you answer this one, but you don't answer the second one where I asked, the five who are not appointed, why? And I, and I was very clear again that Chen, I said, if you are saying Tebuho uh, could not be appointed, uh, come, you must say to me, Tebuho comes from constituency A, uh, in the construction industry, and but we could not um, appoint him because um, there are allegation X, Y, and B against him. So when you answer that, in fact, uh, I was asking this as a trick question because I wanted to check why would in Tabise or Anumpendulo from construction A who was on the board that was accused of failing their fiduciary duty, very serious charge, be allowed to come back. But the uh, Buho from construction B can be allowed. Uh, and what, we don't know what are the reasons here. Are they because of the fiduciary duty? Are they because over and above that, Teboho is now accused by this uh, um, um, investigative report uh, to, have been, to have been doing one, two, three. So where do we draw the line? Must I be pointed out by uh, um, this uh, um, uh, investigative uh, uh, exercise? Only or because for me, Chair, being accused of failing your fiduciary duty is an extremely serious offense. So I want to uh, maybe maybe that Mabuza must not even attempt to answer this thing if he's not going to answer uh, uh, this one, Chair. Maybe let's defer it to uh, the meeting that I've asked uh, with yourselves. Uh, to 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 get with the political leadership and the DG there to try and answer this one, but um, so chair, my, that was where I was coming from. Um, now, further question: I think we must have a, 
um, um, our colleagues there on, on certification, they must, they must have an action plan. They must just give us an action plan uh, if they don't have it already. They must just give us an action plan on reaching day zero on certification. Um, and then, um, uh, Chair, we, we on the bargaining council, if you remember last year, or it was in 2020, maybe last year, we had a, a meeting, I think we were meeting with the services seat, and we said, because of these problems that persist, uh, you know, this seat are doing bargaining this way, that seat are bargaining this way, and all of that, maybe we need to have a central bargaining council led by the department itself. So that we don't get this thing here, salary scale stay, that doesn't make sense. In fact, when we're saying this chair, where uh, it was a it was an afterthought, but we're saying <clears throat> it can be that uh, the services seat, I think, can't remember, yeah, I think it was a services seat. Who when they had um, um, up, um, advertise the position, I think, of CEO or senior management. I can't remember clearly, and I apologize. And services CETA being the, 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 the biggest CETA in terms of uh, uh, programs and budget. The academic qualifications there were lower than some of the CETAs who are considered in budget and size to be lower than the the services seat. And we said that also, you know, each CETA can create their own uh, specifications when it comes to senior management to, and, and all of that. Maybe let's have a standard. Let's say in order to be a CEO of a seat and all of them, this will be the basic requirements. Or to be a CFO, this will be. So it came from that part. And we said, uh, Chairperson, Maybe the, let's also have a bargaining council being central so that you don't get this CETA uh, negotiating with, uh, let me make an example with Nehau, and uh, they are agreeing on 10% increase this year. But that CETA uh, negotiating with Nehau, they agree on 7%, and the third CETA uh, uh, negotiating with Nehau don't reach an agreement. Uh, so that doesn't make sense. So we said, let there be a, a, a central bargaining cancer uh, on these issues. Again, Chairperson, to avoid what uh, uh, Honorable Yabo asked and the answer we're getting, uh, which I'm not sure if maybe he's uh, happy with the answer. I, I, I had the answer, Chair, uh, but I don't think it makes sense to me even now. But maybe even this question must go to that meeting, Chairperson, which I'm lobbying yourselves to find and put, put this matter in our fourth uh, quarter report as early as possible. Uh, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's between B triple R's or immediately after B triple R's, but it must come as early as possible. Uh, so maybe we must, we must uh, schedule our program and bring this matter back because from where I am, Chairperson, even the answers that uh, colleagues will try and, and some of the answers, like I said, shame Rabba you know, uh, they, they should not even be answering them. They, they are not, they were not supposed to be meant for them. Uh, but uh, yeah, so hence I'm asking, Chair, maybe let's, put uh, those questions to those uh, to the political leadership and the DG and the DDG of skills development to try and assist us uh, on these issues. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Itzie. Let me perhaps hand back to CEO um, and, and hopefully we'll, CEO will be able to you know, close the gap where really there hasn't been adequate responses. But as you said now in your conclusion, it, there definitely is a need for us to pick up on this conversation. Chair, with the, 
uh, Honorable Yabo, sorry, did I miss your hand? Well, I seem to be struggling to find my hand on the on the system. Um, okay, you can continue before I hand over, hand back to colleagues. Um, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Che. I, I think the the response uh, we got on the question um, or set of questions I asked. Uh, did not uh, speak to what what led to the disparities in the in the grades, and you know, sitting here um, and I'm following uh, Honorable Litsia's inputs, and I'm thinking about uh, this anomaly, um, uh, and it uh, it looks to me like. Uh, there were there was probably someone who was pegged at B three, uh, probably forwarded by some powerful personality, and they were just uh, forced to adjust uh, the median uh, of the grade itself and the salary scale to accommodate this powerful person because any logic presented on why you would have such a disparity doesn't suffice, save for uh, a situation where you are trying to overcompensate for someone who's either very special or very powerful. How do you get to a point where you have such disparities? And if these are legacy problems, I think uh, the the successors in title to whom we are speaking today must just say to us, honorable members, the committee, these are legacy problems. We found this thing this way. We do not know what informed it, but we would probably uh, probe and find out why it is this, it is this way. The B3 scale is, is, is higher than the C2, C3, C4 scales. The E3 scale is higher than the E4 scale. And you would suppose that on the E4 scale, this is where the, the chief executive officer sits, et cetera, et cetera. But the medians of those scales do not make sense. And if this is a legacy problem, perhaps we should also uh, be furnished with whether the AG at one point or another would have picked up on the anomaly and raised it as, as part of its uh, uh, findings or on its notes uh, to, to management. Um, the response given chair is not speaking to the why, um, and we can appreciate that we are given uh, answers to that uh, the, the unions have raised the question on it, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but, it looks it looks uh, clumsy to say the least that perhaps there was a, a need to accommodate someone or some people uh, and give them uh, salaries that are higher than the average in the whole sector by the way not just in the CETA. and and we cannot as a committee see that spot it and not want to have answers to the questions we are raising. And so yes, I agree with the Honorable Litsie. The, the responses provided or furnished uh, are insufficient in as far as understanding the logic behind uh, such uh, anomalous uh, schemes presented uh, in that uh, particular report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Yabu. Colleagues, I must also um, acknowledge the presence, I believe, of the AG's office. I think the only Zamashang I know is that from the AG's office, if I'm not mistaken, and I see they are on the platform. Um, so welcome to those colleagues, and I hope you are noting some of the concerns that are coming from members 
um, some as articulated by Honorable Lutsie. Um And I think, uh, sorry, Honorable Yabo. And I think uh, as we go into the first two weeks of term four and deal with the BRRR process, some of these matters are that of which we would appreciate for the AG to give us um, a synopsis of their analyses of, of these matters. Um, colleagues, I would also like to perhaps as we hand back to the CETA, um, to get an understanding on, on where we are sitting as a, uh, as a CETA on the implementation of the ARPL um, and that particular policy and where we are in, in terms of our uh, implementation. So if Kulis could give us an update on that, because I think it's something that all CETAs should be implementing by now. And then um, I would want to guide us by saying some of the matters that colleagues, that honorable members request to have better clarity on, maybe it will, it will assist for us to request that those matters be submitted to us in writing. Um, so that we can collate the information that is that is needed. And then in, in that we would appreciate for, um, we, we would appreciate it if the CETA could include details on the certification backlog and also work towards what we have uh, really made great strides on with the TBED program, but essentially work towards a back, a day zero on the backlog on certification. And I think um, the CETA needs to establish that particular date, uh, report that date to the portfolio committee and um, work towards that. So the date will essentially speak to a day zero of your certification backlog and, um, be, and update us as a portfolio committee on what date you have set to afford us um, the ability to, to monitor and, 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 and track um, the implementation or the work that you'll be doing toward, uh, towards uh, achieving that day zero. Um, and then, yeah, so I think I'd leave it at, I'll leave it at that for now and hand back to the, the, the CEO. Um, we would like to conclude uh, soon. So if colleagues can please be to respond adequately to our questions. Um, and then that of which would be outstanding, we will receive in writing, but there definitely is a need for a follow-up meeting um, as, as mentioned um, on multiple occasions by Honorable Lizier. And uh, we will see how we can then schedule that in for hopefully the next term. So let me hand back to you CEO. Thank you, Chair. My sincere apologies because of my load shading issues and I couldn't move on time. I, I've been struggling to reconnect. So I will ask for guidance in case I miss some of the critical issues that I needed to address. I understand the first question that was regarding the returning board members and those that were not appointed. Uh, which um, Mr. Nguban has attempted, I understand, to answer. I'll just clarify just a few things. And Chair, I understand as well, there was a question regarding the allegations and the management. I'm not sure if I got that correctly, that I need to respond to that uh, issue. Then I will touch on the issue of the ARPL rates. And then the issue of, uh, there was a question also about uh, Ms. Mputi's qualification as to what was done that just came now as I was listening when I, I, was, uh, I was back and the issues of salaries, whether AG had raised findings on these issues in the past. So those are the issues that I have recently as I've, uh, I've managed to connect throughout. Um, Chair, let me start with the issue of uh, the, the board at, at high level. I know this is the question that is, seems to be directed at the political leadership. From our side, 
um, we understand that for the retaining board members, <clears throat> before the previous board was dissolved and the administration was gazetted, uh, there were constituencies which were in the board which had already raised complaints and then they resigned or they recalled their nominated members from the board, which nine out of 10 were from the Labour being the representative of Bikau and NUM. And therefore, by the time that board was dissolved because of certain things they had already reported that they were not in agreement with, those organizations were no longer in the board. Hence, also by virtue of the requirements of the law, that we need to have the representative from the constituencies. When the vacancies were advertised for the board this time for its reconstitution, those organizations by, by law, they qualify to nominate and they nominated those members which currently are not implicated per what we, we understand. And then with regards to some of those who were nominated, it is indeed true that there are some previous members of the board that are cited in the forensic report that the minister is sitting with, having done certain things that were gross violations of regulations and laws, which potentially led to irregularities happening in the organization. We understand that it would have been risky for the minister to reappoint those with those issues, because then they will be compromised and be compromising the organization from an, a governance perspective. And then uh, when it comes to nominations that are received, the CETA is receiving sufficient nominations. However, they are not compliant when it comes because the act is very clear that we need six representing organized labor. We need six representing organized employer. We need one, uh, representing government departments and then one representing community or bargaining council or an NGO. In this regard, the, the vacancies that currently exist for the five is based on the fact that we got so many applications coming from professional bodies, but there's only one vacancy per the legislation that needs to be filled in that regard. When it comes to employer organization, the same struggle as well was experienced that uh, uh, some were not compliant. Some organization, they will claim to be employer organization, but they don't have the certificate from Department of Labor, which by virtue, if you say you are a labor representing organization or employer, there must be a certificate that is signed by Department of Labor confirming such. Uh, with regard to the cost of advert, we'll ask that uh, we submit the correct answer to this question uh, subsequent to this session so that we don't mislead the committee with regard to the cost. We'll compile the exact cost and submit accordingly. Chair, um, maybe to answer this, uh, the issue of the ARPR rates, the new circular became effective from um, from 1 April 2022, and with the window that was just closed in August this year, all the new awards then will be based on the rates of this secular. So it's in progress to be implemented accordingly by the CETA. And then with regard to salaries issues in the past, uh, in line with many other issues that were, were identified during administration and investigations, the issue of salary discrepancies and all other HR-related matters were never raised by the Auditor General in that the organization in all those years was getting clean audits and these matters were not flagged. And then the administrator did attempt to engage with the Auditor General herself to indicate that we got these potential issues in that there were issues that were not addressed or raised in the organization that uh, has led the organization to be under administration. <laughs> With regard to the issues, yeah, qualifications, yeah, Ms. Mfuti, yes, it is true that this is a historic matter that the employee is not new, was already in the organization before administration. And then the OD process, uh, placed through the approval of the administrator, uh, the same 
official in the position that is being cited. Nevertheless, the experience requirements are met, it's only the academic requirements that are not met for this official to occupy that position. This matter has been raised by the AG this year as well. So it's in the process of being addressed in the organization. Uh, the, with the understanding that I was asked a question to respond to, to the manner of the allegations, I will attempt to do that. Uh, I started my role uh, officially on the 1st of September. That was still during administration last year. And then uh, on my taking over that the role of the CEO, I did uh, uh, notice certain red flag in certain processes of the organization, which at that time I wrote to the administrator, uh, highlighting various issues of non-compliance that were, were red flag as what I was reviewing at the time. And then uh, I then, propose the institution, especially on the procurement area, which most of the allegations that were raised relates to the procurement and tender processes. Most of them uh, were already awarded. And then I, I instituted what is called the probity audit, which is a specific and specialized audit that looks into the audit of a procurement process to check if it's compliant with the principles of transparency, compliance, value for money, et cetera. And then uh, we instituted for everything that was awarded, whether through a quotation process uh, or a tender process from 1st of April, 2021 to 30 September at that time, and then the report was finalized in March this year, 2022, indeed confirming that there were various irregularities that had taken place in the organization before the finalization of the report. Because of the nature of certain things that had happened in certain tenders, by January as a CEO, I canceled certain tenders, including the security services tender, which was regularly awarded and in a fraudulent manner. And then uh, we had that kind of audit extended by the instruction or delegation of the Audit and Risk Committee when that report was tabled to say we now need to be looking at uh, uh, tenders starting from 1st of October to 30th April this year. That uh, audit just been completed is in the process of being tabled to management because it was also delayed by virtue that the same processes were also being the subject of the review by AG during their regulatory audits. With regard to the appointments that were alleged to have not been followed, to have not followed the process, uh, there was no substance to such in that all the appointments, especially at executive level, they are properly and suitably qualified and experienced, and the processes as prescribed by the policies of the organization were followed, where uh, the internal uh, adverts were not made, uh, the approvals were duly obtained from the accounting authority who was the administrator at the time. And then uh, with regard to consultants that were appointed in the organization, where the skills audit that was undertaken during the audit indicated various uh, weaknesses in terms of the skilling and capacity in the organization over and above that after the placement through the OD of all the staff in the organization being placed into the new positions that were in the uh, new organization organogram that was redesigned. There were still vacancies for, for critical positions as well, which then necessitated that for the organization to achieve its objectives and the strategic uh, uh, objectives and the mandate and to deliver on the APP targets, it was necessary for the organization to engage some consultants uh, in one way or the other, and those were the basis. At the moment, there's not been any employee that has been uh, replaced by consultant because we still got vacancies, despite that we got certain constraints when it comes to capacity. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes uh, to many other matters, uh, Chairperson, I believe they have been addressed. The issues of salary discrepancies uh, as was outlined uh, and uh, explained by the executive. That process we have uh, handed over to the newly reconstituted uh, HR remuneration committee uh, 
uh, to deal with the matters of salary discrepancies and also the support uh, for those who were placed in new position as well. Uh, that process is underway to give them the necessary support they need for them to perform uh, effectively in their new placed roles. However, we'll still have the issues that are legacy matters that are yet to be looked into by that relevant committee, including the issue of salaries uh, and the benefits as well, including the pension fund contribution issue, which the board has made a particular resolution with regard uh, uh, the, with the, the way forward to resolve the matter, whether CETA will continue to contribute 100% or not, the resolution is already in place in that regard. I won't believe that uh, <coughs> that is in the in the process of being effectively resolved, Chairperson. If I have left out any aspect, I will ask to be guided at this point in time. All right, can I check with the um, chair of the board if there's anything he would like to add? No, no not at all, uh, Chairperson. I wanted to, because I've realized that a lot of issues and based uh, based on uh, Honorable Member Letia's comments, and the uh, honorable member Yalos Yabo's comments were that some issues may not necessarily be sufficiently disposed at this session. Uh, I wanted to check before I make my closing remarks if um, there's anything which my fellow board members want to add, particularly Mr. Vilagazi and um, Mr. Masimele. If none, I will then uh, rely on and be you know, indebted in your guidance, uh, Chair, in terms of the, the way forward. Thank you. Um, sorry, Chair, just one, one second. So um, the CEO didn't check with uh, his team if there's any matter, you know, any of those colleagues would like to elaborate on unless he believes he has sufficiently represented the entire um, management. CEO? Hey. No, it seems uh, uh, I'm getting sense that I covered most of the issues I was supposed to cover, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, can the, could the, the, the other board members that are on the platform, if you can make your inputs, please. Chair, good morning and other members. I think I'm Philip Villagas, like uh, the chairperson of the AA, Mr. Masombuga has stated. This is the first baptism of fire as, as members of the AA, which we take traction of a number of lessons learned. Commenting now, it will be just to say to members of the portfolio committee, we appreciate your kindness and openness in articulating the issues that says to us, there is nothing personal except to say, let the right things be done by the right people at the right time for the right cause. And with that being said, therefore, it is up to us as members of the board to sit down and ensure that mechanically from administration's point of view, we put systems in place and we become consultative structure to play a clear oversight role to the extent where other questions asked, like this thing of saying, by any chance do we see ourselves sustaining this move to a point where we cannot be taken back to administration? It's neither here nor there, but in this course of life, everything is possible, even though it is not within our mandate or intention to be seen as people who are taken under administration again. It depends on the individual moral ethics and the focus insofar as the act mandate to the board is concerned. We really appreciate your time. Your kindness, Chair, is really appreciated. The rest will definitely discuss and will we'll engage when the process unfolds. So I submit, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, maybe to throw in my input, uh, maybe to start uh, appreciating and thanking the honorable members from the portfolio committee uh, for, for raising the issues that really require uh, our, our undivided attention. And uh, I have to indicate that uh, coming from the industry with an aerial view, of the challenges we have with regard not only to skills, but to quality skills. You know, it is really our responsibility to make sure that uh, we really deliver on that mandate and, uh, and also making sure that uh, we collaborate with other government entities, you know, that have the same mandate, either partially or, 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 or or, or the full mandate towards uh, uh, the development of skills within the construction industry. And uh, uh, for us, uh, as a mammoth task, you know, is the question that has been posed that uh, what is it that we're going to do to make sure that we, you know, we, we really uh, arrest, you know, uh, 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 this, uh, 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 maybe to co for lack of a better way, to this pandemic of always going into administration. Uh, it's not going to be a simple task. We'll still rely on the support of this August uh, uh, portfolio committee to support us in that. And, and indeed, uh, uh, you know, when, when you try to fix, you know, something that is, uh, and, and maybe to call it a, a, dead, a, a dead horse, you, you will indeed uh, step on other people's toes. And, and, and for that, we rely on this portfolio community to support us. And we, we endeavor, you know, to work closely with management, you know, to make sure that the, uh, the CETA, you know, go back to, uh, to proper governance and in particular, trying to make sure that uh, we address the challenges of the, the administration costs going beyond the threshold because the money that is collected indeed is for the industry or for CETA to make sure that there are proper skills and quality skills within the industry. Uh, on that note, uh, thank you very much, Chair and colleagues. Thank you very much. Um, Chair Masomboga, can I check if that will be it from your side then? Yeah, well, uh, if it, it is your meeting, Chair. It is your meeting. Maybe what is important for now is uh, just to take you from my colleagues, indicate that uh, one of my parting shots and, and, and remarks that we'll make is to give assurance that uh, we are called upon to serve in this board and accounting authority, not only because we want to take individual and unilateral level of excellence, but to share our collective wisdom and experience in fixing what needs to be fixed. What I said when I opened the induction workshop, Chairperson, which we had, was to emphasize that we are going to have to do things differently to fix whatever needs to be fixed in reinstating the 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 CETA to what it previously used to be. This CETA used to be a second best in the in the sector in the country of the 21 family of CETAs, and it must get back to that unequivocally. We have attempted to commit ourselves using our both our individual and collective wisdom to fix whatever we can fix within our paradigm. There are legacy issues. Honorable Yabo was correct. There are certain things which we cannot dispose of immediately. They are going to be work in progress. 
we don't have the whole day, we don't have the whole decade. Our term of office come to an end on the 31st of March in 2025. We do not have the luxury of time, but what we do have is the commitment to ensure that whatever we can fix within our disposal, we do fix. Measure us in 12 months, measure us in 18 months, we should be able to come back to inform this committee, stakeholders and the people of our country, what is it that we have done within our reasonable disposal. We, in, we told management that we are going to hurry, that we are going to hurry slowly, because part of what happened in the past has been the extent of expedience in doing things and at the end of the day, doing things that fly in the face of quality contribution to the skills development trajectory. Your comments that you made, Chairperson, earlier, that uh, it is our responsibility ultimately to ensure that young people in this country are adequately favored and equipped with quality training. So I can rest assure you now, the theme and the message coming out of this part of the board, this part of the accounting authority is going to be underpinned by quality, quality and quality. Because we must deliver quality for two reasons, to equip our young people, but secondly, to ensure that this country's infrastructure is based on a quality base, which is a foundation. Failure to, in the process of doing that, we must make sure that we reinstate the values and the principles of clean governance on clean audits, not, not, not audit findings, not qualified or unqualified, not disclaimers, not adverse, but clean audits that ensures and assures the stakeholders in this country that the money that is deployed in that institution is done, is spent accordingly in accordance with the prescripts of the annual performance plans, the skills development priorities, and indeed within the framework within which you are appointed. So yes, Chair, thank you very much for this inaugural opportunity. It's a pity we couldn't answer some of those questions as they relate to legacy issues. And we can assure you that not under our watch, this institution will not go back to administration, at least to the best of our abilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thank you very much to all the colleagues from the board, as well as the management of the Construction Education and Training Authority. Um, I think it's, it's important to emphasize the fact that there will be a need for us to engage with, um, with colleagues from the ministry um, and from the department or, you know, led by the DG. In fact, I think, let, let me be specific, it, it would be important for us to receive a further briefing by colleagues in the ministry and the DG on some of the matters that we've discussed this, this morning. Um, and some of the other matters that uh, have that we've raised, I know have been noted by colleagues um, from the AG's office, and we will be engaging with them in about three weeks time. I want to then further request that um, further detail, you know, um, where uh, it's evident that members have not received the type of detail that they would have appreciated from the questions that they asked. I would appreciate it if um, colleagues could kindly submit that information in writing. There are a number of reports that have been requested. Um, forensic report on um, the pension um, benefits uh, matter that, that, that we you know, um, dealt with quite some time ago, I think in 2020 or so. So if, if that report can be furnished to us within the next seven days, um, there's a report that was requested by Honorable King as well, if that could be um, submitted. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, we, the colleagues in the meeting will have to, who are representing the department in the meeting, please do indicate to uh, the DG and the minister that we request um, the administrator's um, report 
uh, within the next seven days as well. Uh, we will also um, write a follow-up letter requesting that particular report as well. Um, and it would be important for us as a portfolio committee to be updated, Chair, once we've managed to, uh, well, uh, between yourselves and, and I guess uh, the department or the ministry, to get an update once the board um, uh, is fully composed. Um, uh, that would that would also be important. Honorable Itzia is requesting the forensic investigation report as well within the next seven days. Um, so yeah, so going back to the matter around the board and the full composition of the board. So once the full complement of the board um, has been put together, which I think um, I, I heard should be uh, instated within the next um, month or so, we would really appreciate for us to be updated in writing on those particular developments. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to go through my notes. I think then colleagues, also on the matter around the um, recognition of prior learning and the programs in relation to that, can we please have something in writing in relation to that that is tangible, that can indicate to us the work that um, you are doing in relation to that. Um, yeah, I think I would like to then leave it at that for now, colleagues. We, we, we will have to, as a portfolio committee, honorable members, um, really continue our, our engagements with the CETA, um, considering the new leadership that is coming on board and therefore there should be um, a turning of the tide. Uh, one of the board members said it's neither here or there. It's long, I say, I'm sure about that. Multi indoors, neither here or there. Ain't give a worried because, you know, but I think the other board member who came later on emphasized the fact, as well as the chair, emphasized the fact that ultimately our collective goal will be to ensure that the organization thrives and it fulfills its core mandate. But it's um, long, is not our mother tongue. So, you know, my city indoor is neither here or there, or maybe the, the member meant with it, and it's, it's unquestionable, it's undebatable, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a standing item or mandate that our ultimate goal will be to ensure that the organization um, turns a tide and that we don't find ourselves in, in a third administration. I think that's what the, the colleague was trying to, to articulate, but as I said, it's long, and says me. Um, but uh, colleagues, I, I, I think also the view of the chair to say ours ultimately, or to say that they would appreciate the constant support of the portfolio committee. We will be there to do that. Um, uh, chair, you know, I, we always say the portfolio committee as Bambanga Ipena red. We don't have a red pen. We're not waiting for you to come. And then we say wrong, 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 bad, bad, bad. We're not on a witch hunt but I believe we are holding a, a, a green pen. When I was studying, I'm not sure, you know, but we, we had, an, a, our educators used the red and green pens. The red pen was to, <laughs> you knew Gusuk Shubin. When she uses the green pen, we are correcting, we are fixing uh, in order for us to be enabled um, to achieve what we're meant to achieve. So that's the, that's the role that we would like to play considering that there is a new leadership. Um, and uh, we would want this leadership to be successful, um, given whatever, given the recommendations that would have come out of the administrator's report that would enable the development that the development that we want. So, so thank you, colleagues. Um, and uh, if you would just really, uh, um, uh, you know, assist us in sending all that information that we have requested in detail uh, in writing within the next seven days. Um, that should that should be fine with us. All right, I think that then brings us to the end of our meeting. I don't think we had any other agenda item, Anele, unless we had. No, we don't have ministers to 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 adopt. So that leaves us there. Honourable members, we will we will um, see each other on Friday again, um, where we are dealing with the uh, Hestil as well as the adoption of the report. Um, on the inquiry on Professor Ambati and related matters. Thank you so much, colleagues. That brings us to the end of our meeting. Uh, thank you, Chair and CEO.
Thank you very much, Chair. Members and colleagues. Thank you, Chairperson and uh, colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, Deputy you, President. Yeah. Enter the Philip. Dama. How are you, Deputy President? Yemona, we are baptized with fire. The we are. I'm, I'm quickly going. I'm quickly going back to the Congress of Kosato. <laughs> no, hey, DP, I, recording. DP, I see you are trending. I see you are trending there on social media for threatening. Yeah, go. For threatening the the the. The, the secretary of the SACP with a dismissible offense. Zakala <laughs> Gok. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's okay, colleagues. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm.